Ulysses 15a, the first of seven parts. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ulysses by James Joyce, 15a. The Mabbot Street entrance of Night Town, before which stretches an uncobbled tram siding set with skeleton tracks, red and green will-o'-the-wisps, and danger signals. Rows of grimy houses with gaping doors. Rare lamps with faint rainbow fans. Round, rabiotis, halted ice gondola, stunted men and women squabble. They grab wafers between which are wedged lumps of coral and copper snow. Sucking, they scatter slowly, children. The swan comb of the gondola, high-reared, forges on through the murk, white and blue under a lighthouse. Whistles call and answer. The calls. Wait, my love, and I'll be with you. The answer. Round behind the stable. A deaf-mute idiot with goggle eyes, his shapeless mouth dribbling, jerks past, shaken in St. Vitus' dance. A chain of children's hands imprisons him. The children. Kithog, salute. The idiot. Lifts a palsied left arm and gurgles. Gahoot. The children. Where's the great light? The idiot, gobbling. Gagahest. They release him. He jerks on. A pygmy woman swings on a rope slung between two railings, counting. A form sprawled against a dustbin and muffled by its arm and hat, snores, groans, grinding, growling teeth, and snores again. On a step, a gnome totting among a rubbish tip crouches to shoulder a sack of rags and bones. A crone, standing by with a smoky oil lamp, rams her last bottle in the maw of his sack. He heaves his booty, tugs askew his peaked cap, and hobbles off mutely. The crone makes back for her lair, swaying her lamp. A bandy child, a squat on the doorstep with a paper shuttlecock, crawls sidling after her in spurts, clutches her skirt, scrambles up. A drunken navvy grips with both hands the railings of an area, lurching heavily. At a corner two night watch in shoulder capes, their hands upon their staff holsters, loom tall. A plate crashes, a woman screams, a child wails. Oaths of a man roar, mutter, cease. Figures wander, lurk, peer from warrens. In a room lit by a candle, stuck in a bottleneck, a slut combs out the tats from the hair of a scruffless child. Sissy Caffrey's voice, still young, sings shrill from a lane. Sissy Caffrey. I gave it to Molly because she was jolly. The leg of the duck, the leg of the duck. Private Carr and Private Compton swagger sticks tight in their oxters as they march unsteadily right about face and burst together from their mouths a volleyed fart. Laughter of men from the lane. A horse virago retorts. The virago. Signs on you, hairy arse, more power the cabin girl. Sissy Caffrey. More luck to me, cabin, coothill, and bell turbot, she sings. I gave it to Nelly to stick in her belly, the leg of the duck. A leg of the duck. Private Carr and Private Compton turn and counter retort. Their tunics bright right in a lamp glow, black sockets of caps on their blond cropped poles. Stephen Dedalus and Lynch pass through the crowd close to the redcoats. Private Compton jerks his finger. Way for the parson. Private Carr turns and calls. What ho, parson? Sissy Caffrey, her voice soaring higher. She has it, she got it, wherever she put it, the leg of the duck. Stephen, flourishing the ash plant on his left hand, chants with joy the introit for paschal time. Lynch, his jockey cap low on his brow, attends him, a sneer of discontent wrinkling his face. Stephen. Vidi aquam egredientem de templo a la terra dextro. Alleluia. The famished snaggletusks of an elderly bawd protrude from a doorway. The bawd, her voice whispering huskily, Shh! Come here till I tell you. 
Maidenhead inside. St. Stephen. Altius aliquantulum. Et omnes ad quos pervenit aqua ista. The bawd spits in their trail her jet of venom. Trinity medicals. Fallopian tube. All prick and no pence. Edie Boardman, sniffling, crouched with Bertha Supple, draws her shawl across her nostrils. Edie Boardman, bickering. And says the one I seen you up faithful place with your square pusher, the greaser off the railway, in his come-to-bed hat. Did you, says I, that's not for you to say, says I, you never seen me in the man-trap with the married highlander, says I, the likes of her. Stag that one is, stubborn as a mule in her walking with two fellows the one time, Kilbride, the engine driver, and Lance Corporal, Oliphant. Stephen, triumphal eater. Salvi facti sunt. He flourishes his ash-plant, shivering the lamp image, shattering light over the world. A liver and white spaniel on the prowl slinks after him, growling. Lynch scares it with a kick. Lynch. So that? Stephen looks behind. So that gesture, not music, not odor, would be a universal language, the gift of tongues, rendering visible not the lay sense, but the first entelechy, the structural rhythm. Lynch. Pornosophical philotheology, metaphysics in Mecklenburg Street. Stephen. We have shrew-ridden Shakespeare and henpecked Socrates. Even the all-wisest Stagrite was bitted, bridled, and mounted by a light of love. Lynch. Bah. Stephen. Anyway, who wants two gestures to illustrate a loaf and a jug? This movement illustrates the loaf and jug of bread or wine in Omar. Hold my stick. Lynch. Damn your yellow stick. Where are you going? Stephen. Lecherous links to la belle dame sans merci, Georgina Johnson. Ad deum qui laetificat inventuta meum. Stephen thrusts the ash plant on him and slowly holds out his hands, his head going back till both hands are a span from his breast, downturned, in planes intersecting, the fingers about to part, the left being higher. Lynch. Which is the jug of bread? It skills not. That or the custom house. Illustrate thou. Here, take your crutch and walk. They pass. Tommy Caffrey scrambles to a gas lamp and clasping climbs in spasms. From the top spur he slides down. Jackie Caffrey clasps to climb. The navvy lurches against the lamp. The twins scuttle off in the dark. The navvy, swaying, presses a forefinger against a wing of his nose and ejects from the farther nostril a long liquid jet of snot. Shouldering the lamp, he staggers away through the crowd with his flaring cresset. Snakes of river fog creep slowly from drains, clefts, cesspools, mid middens, arise on all sides, stagnant fumes. A glow leaps in the south beyond the seaward reaches of the river. The navvy, staggering forward, cleaves the crowd and lurches toward the tram siding. On the further side, under the railway bridge, Bloom appears, flushed, panting, cramming bread and chocolate into a side pocket. From Gillen's hairdresser's window, a composite portrait shows him gallant Nelson's image. A concave mirror at the side presents to him lovelorn, long-lost, lugubru buluhum. Grave Gladstone sees him level, bloom for bloom. He passes, struck by the stare of truculent Wellington, but in the convex mirror grin, unstuck, the Bonham eyes and fat chuck cheek chops of Jolly Poldy, the Ricksticks Doldy. At Antonio Rabiotti's door, Bloom halts, sweated under the bright arc lamp. He disappears. In a moment he reappears and hurries on. Bloom. Fish and tatters and Ah! He disappears into Olhausen's, the pork butcher's, under the downcoming roll shutter. A few moments later he emerges from under the shutter, puffing poldy, blowing bluehoom. In each hand he holds a parcel, one containing a lukewarm pig's crubine, the other a cold sheep's trotter, sprinkled with whole pepper. He gasps, standing upright, then bending to one side he presses a parcel against his ribs and groans. 
bloom stitch in my side why did i run he takes breath with care and goes forward slowly towards the lamp-set siding the glow leaps again bloom what is that a flasher searchlight he stands at cormac's corner watching bloom aurora borealis or a steel foundry ah the brigade of course south side anyhow big blaze might be his house beggar's bush we're safe he hums cheerfully london's burning london's burning on fire on fire he catches sight of the navvy lurching through the crowd at the farther side of talbot street i'll miss him run quick better cross here he darts to cross the road urchins shout the urchins mind out mister two cyclists with lighted paper lanterns a-swing swim by him grazing him their bells rattling the bells halt yalt 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 bloom halts erect stung by a spasm ow he looks round darts forward suddenly through the rising fog a dragon sandstrewer travelling at caution slews heavily down upon him its huge red headlight winking its trolley hissing on the wire the motorman bangs his foot gong the gong bang bang blob back blood bug blue the brake cracks violently bloom raising a policeman's white-gloved hand blunders stiff-legged out of the track the motorman thrown forward pug-nosed on the guide-wheel yells as he slides past over chains and keys the motorman hey shit breeches are you doing the hat trick bloom trick leaps to the curbstone and halts again he brushes a mud-flake from his cheek with a parcelled hand bloom no thoroughfare close shave that but cured the stitch must take up sandow's exercises again on the hands down insure against street accident too the providential he feels his trouser pocket poor mamma's panacea heel easily catch in track or bootlace in a cog day the wheel of the black maria peeled off my shoe at leonard's corner third time is the charm shoe trick insolent driver i ought to report him tension makes them nervous might be the fellow balked me this morning with that horsey woman same style of beauty quick of him all the same the stiff walk true words spoken in jest that awful cramp in lad lane something poisonous i ate emblem of luck why probably lost cattle mark of the beast he closes his eyes an instant bit light in the head monthly or effect of the other brain fog fag that tired feeling too much for me now ow a sinister figure leans on plated legs against o'beirne's wall a visage unknown injected with dark mercury from under a wide-leaved sombrero the figure regards him with evil eye bloom buenas noches senorita blanca que calle es esta the figure impassive raises a signal arm password sraid mabot bloom <laughs> merci esperanto slan leath he mutters gaelic league spy sent by that fire-eater he steps forward a sack-shouldered ragman bars his path he steps left ragsack man left bloom i beg he swerves sidles step aside slips past and on bloom keep to the right 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 if there is a signpost planted by the touring club at step aside who procured that public boon i who lost my way and contributed to the columns of the irish cyclist the letter headed in darkest step aside keep 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 to the right rags and bones at midnight a fence more likely first place murderer makes for wash off his sins of the world jackie caffrey hunted by tommy caffrey runs full tilt against bloom bloom oh socked on weak hams he halts 
Tommy and Jackie vanish there, there. Bloom pats with parceled hands. Watch fob. Pocket book pocket. Purse poke. Sweets of sin. Potato soap. Bloom. Beware of pickpockets. Old thieves dodge. Collide. Then snatch your purse. The retriever approaches, sniffing nose to the ground. A sprawled form sneezes. A stooped bearded figure appears, garbed in the long caftan of an elder in Zion, and a smoking cap with magenta tassels. Horned spectacles hang down at the wings of the nose. Yellow poison streaks are on the drawn face. Rudolph. Second half-crown waste money today. I told you not to go with drunken goy ever. So you catch no money. Bloom hides the crubeen and trotter behind his back and, crestfallen, feels warm and cold feet meat. Ja, ich weiß, Papachi. Rudolph. What you making down this place? Have you no soul? With feeble vulture talons he feels the silent face of Bloom. Are you not my son Leopold, the grandson of Leopold? Are you not my dear son Leopold, who left the house of his father and left the gods of his father Abraham and Jacob? Bloom, with precaution. I suppose so, father. Mosenthal, all that's left of him. Rudolph, severely. One night they bring you home drunk as dog after you spend your good money. What you call them, running chaps? Bloom, in youth's smart blue Oxford suit with white vest slips, narrow-shouldered in brown alpine hat, wearing gent's sterling silver Waterbury keyless watch and double curb Albert with seal attached, one side of him coated with stiffening mud. A harriers, father, only that once. Rudolph, once. Mud, head to foot, cut your hand open, lock jaw. They make you kaput, Leopold Leyden. You watch them chaps. Bloom weakly. They challenged me to a sprint. It was muddy. I slipped. Rudolph with contempt. Goyim naches. Nice spectacles for your poor mother. Bloom. Mama. Ellen Bloom. In pantomime dame stringed mobcap. Widow Twankey's crinoline and bustle. Blouse with mutton leg sleeves buttoned behind. Gray mittens and cameo brooch. Her plaited hair in a crispine net appears over the staircase banisters, a slanted candlestick in her hand, and cries out in shrill alarm, Oh, blessed Redeemer, what have they done to him? My smelling salts! She hauls up a wreath of skirt and ransacks the pouch of her striped blay petticoat. A file, an angus dye, a shriveled potato, and a celluloid doll fall out. Sacred heart of Mary, where were you at all, at all? Bloom, mumbling, his eyes downcast, begins to bestow his parcels in his filled pockets, but desists, muttering. A voice, sharply. Poldy. Bloom. Who? He ducks and wards off a blow, clumsily. At your service. He looks up. Beside her mirage of date palms, a handsome woman in Turkish costume stands before him. Opulent curves fill out her scarlet trousers and jacket slashed with gold. A wide yellow cummerbund girdles her. A white yashmak, violet in the night, covers her face, leaving free only her large, dark eyes and raven hair. Bloom. Molly. Marion. Welly. Mrs. Marion, from this out, my dear man, when you speak to me. Satirically. As poor little hobby, cold feet, waiting so long. Bloom shifts from foot to foot. No, no, not the least little bit. He breathes in deep agitation, swallowing gulps of air, questions, hopes, crew beans for her supper, things to tell her, excuse, desire, spellbound. A coin gleams on her forehead, on her feet are jeweled toe rings, her ankles are linked by slender fetter chain. Beside her a camel, hooded with the turreting turban, waits. A silk ladder of innumerable rungs climbs to his bobbing howda. He ambles near with disgruntled hindquarters. Fiercely she slaps his haunch. Her gold curb wrist bangles angling, scolding him in Moorish. Marion. Nebrakada. Femininum. 
The camel, lifting a foreleg, plucks from a tree a large mango fruit, offers it to his mistress, blinking in his cloven hoof, then droops his head and grunting, with uplifted neck, fumbles to kneel. Bloom stoops his back for leapfrog. Bloom. I can give you, I mean, as your business manager, Mrs. Marion, if you... Marion. So you notice some change. Her hand passing slowly over her trinketed stomacher, a slow, friendly mockery in her eyes. Oh, Poldy, Poldy, you are a poor old stick in the mud. Go and see life, see the wide world. Bloom. I was just going back for that lotion, white wax, orange flower water. Shop closes early on Thursday, but the first thing in the morning... He pats diver's pockets. This moving kidney. Ah! He points to the south, then to the east. A cake of new clean lemon soap arises, diffusing light and perfume. The soap. We are a capital couple, our bloom and I. He brightens the earth, I polish the sky. The freckled face of Sweeney, the druggist, appears in the disk of the soap sun. Sweeney. Three and a penny, please. Bloom. Yes, for my wife, Mrs. Marion's special recipe. Marion softly. Poldy. Bloom. Yes, ma'am. Marion. Ti tremo un poco il cuore. In disdain she saunters away, humming the duet from Don Giovanni, plump as a pampered pouter pigeon. Bloom. Are you sure about that voglio? I mean, the pronunciation? He follows, followed by the sniffing terrier. The elderly bod seizes his sleeve, the bristles of her chin-mole glittering. The bod. Ten shillings a maiden head fresh. Thing was never touched. Fifteen. There's no one in it. Only her old father that's dead drunk. She points. In the gap of her dark den, furtive, rain-bedraggled Bridey Kelly stands. Bridey. Hatch Street. Any good in your mind? With a squeak, she flaps her bat-shawl and runs. A burly rough pursues with booted strides. He stumbles on the steps, recovers, plunges into gloom. Weak squeaks of laughter are heard, weaker. The bod, her wolf-eyes shining. He's getting his pleasure. You won't get a virgin in the flash-houses. Ten shillings. Don't be all night before the police in plain clothes sees us. Sixty-seven is a bitch. Leering, Gertie McDowell limps forward. She draws from behind, ogling, and shows coyly her bloodied clout. Gertie. With all my worldly goods, I, thee, and thou. She murmurs. You did that. I hate you. Bloom. I? When? You are dreaming. I never saw you. The bod. Leave the gentleman alone, you cheat. Writing the gentleman false letters. Street walking and soliciting. Better for your mother take the strap to you at the bedpost, hussy like you. Gertie, to Bloom. When you saw the secrets of my bottom drawer, she paused, his sleeve slobbering. Dirty married man, I love you for doing that to me. She glides away crookedly. Mrs. Breen, in man's frieze overcoat with loose bellows pockets, stands in the causeway, her roguish eyes wide open, smiling in all her herbivorous buck teeth. Mrs. Breen. Mr. Bloom coughs gravely. <clears throat> Madam, when we last had this pleasure by letter, dating the sixteenth instant. Mrs. Breen. Mr. Bloom, you down here in the haunts of sin, I caught you nicely. Scamp. Bloom, hurriedly. Not so loud, my name. Whatever do you think of me? Don't give me away. Walls have ears. How do you do? It's ages since I... You're looking splendid. Absolutely it... Seasonable weather we're having this time of year. Black refracts heat. Shortcut home here. Interesting quarter. Rescue of fallen women. Magdalene Asylum. I am the secretary. Mrs. Breen holds up a finger. Now, don't tell a big fib. I know somebody won't like that. Oh, just wait till I see Molly. Slyly. Account for yourself this very minute, or woe betide you. Bloom looks behind. She often said she'd like to visit, slumming the exotic, you see. Negro servants in livery, too, if she had money. Othello, black brute. 
Eugene Stratton. Even the bones and corner man at the Livermore Christie's, Bohe brothers, sweep for that matter. Tom and Sam Bohe, coloured coons in white duck suits, scarlet socks, upstarched Sambo chokers and large scarlet asters in their buttonholes, leap out. Each has a banjo slung. Their paler, smaller negroid hands jingle the twing-twang wires. Flashing white kaffir eyes and tusks, they rattle through the breakdown in clumsy clogs, twinging, singing, back to back, toe, heel, heel, with smack fat clacking nigger lips. Tom and Sam. There's someone in the house with Dinah, there's someone in the house I know, there's someone in the house with Dinah, playing on the old banjo. They whisk black masks from raw babby faces, then chuckling, chortling, trumming, twanging, they diddle diddle cakewalk dance away. Bloom with a sour, tenderish smile. A little shrivel, shall we, if you are so inclined? Would you like me, perhaps, to embrace you just for a fraction of a second? Mrs. Breen screams gaily. Oh, you ruck! You ought to see yourself. Bloom, for old sake's sake, I only meant a square party, a mixed marriage mingling of our different little conjugals. You know I had a soft corner for you. Gloomily. "'Twas I sent you that valentine of the dear gazelle. "'Mrs. Breen. "'Glory, Alice, you do look a holy show. "'Killing simply.' "'She puts out her hand inquisitively. "'What are you hiding behind your back? "'Tell us. "'There's a dear.' "'Bloom seizes her wrist with his free hand. "'Josie Powell that was, prettiest Deb in Dublin.' How time flies by, do you remember, harking back in retrospective arrangement, old Christmas night, Georgina Simpson's housewarming while they were playing the Irving Bishop game, finding the pin blindfold and thought-reading. Subject. What is in this snuff-box? Mrs. Breen. You were the lion of the night with your serio-comic recitation, and you looked the part. You were always a favorite with the ladies. Bloom. Squire of dames, in dinner jacket with watered silk facings, blue masonic badge in his buttonhole, black bow and mother-of-pearl studs, a prismatic champagne glass tilted in his hand. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Ireland, home and beauty. Mrs. Breen, the dear dead days beyond recall, love's old sweet song. Bloom meaningfully dropping his voice i confess i'm teapot with curiosity to find out whether some person's something is a little teapot at present mrs breen gushingly tremendously teapot london's teapot and i'm simply teapot all over me she rubs sides with him after the parlour mystery games and the crackers from the tree we sat on the staircase ottoman under the mistletoe to his company. Bloom, wearing a purple Napoleon hat with an amber half-moon, his fingers and thumb passing slowly down to her soft, moist, meaty palm, which she surrenders gently. The witching hour of night, I took the splinter out of his hand carefully, slowly. Tenderly he slips on her finger a ruby ring. La siderem la mano. Mrs. Breen, in a one-piece evening frock, executed in moonlight blue, a tinsel sylph's diadem on her brow, and her dance-card fallen beside her moon-blue satin slippers, curves her palm softly, breathing quickly. Foglio e no, you're hot, you're scalding, the left hand nearest the heart. Bloom. When you made your present choice, they said it was beauty and the beast. I can never forgive you that. His clenched fist at his brow. Think what it means, all you meant to me then, hoarsely. Woman, it's breaking me. Dennis Breen, white tall hatted, with wisdom Healy's sandwich boards, shuffles past them in carpet slippers, his dull beard thrust out, muttering to right and left. Little Alf Bergen, cloaked in the pall of the ace of spades, dogs him to left and right, doubled in laughter. Alf Bergen points jeeringly at the sandwich boards. You, Pete, up, Mrs. Breen to Bloom. 
High jinks below stairs. She gives him the glad eye. Why didn't you kiss the spot to make it well you wanted to? Bloom shocked. Molly's best friend, could you? Mrs. Breen, her pulpy tongue between her lips, offers a pigeon kiss. Hmm. <laughs> the answer is a lemon. Have you a little present for me there? Bloom offhandedly. Kosher, a snack for supper. The home without potted meat is incomplete. I was at Lea, Mrs. Bandman Palmer, trenchant exponent of Shakespeare. Unfortunately, threw away the programme. Rattling good place round there for pig's feet. Feel. Richie Goulding, three ladies' hats pinned on his head, appears weighted to one side by the black legal bag of Collins and Ward, on which a skull and crossbones are painted in white lime wash. He opens it and shows it full of polonies, kippered herrings, finden haddies, and tight-packed pills. Richie. Best value in dub. Bald Pat, bothered beetle, stands on the curbstone, folding his napkin, waiting to wait. Pat. Advances with a tilted dish of spill-spilling gravy. Steak and kidney, bottle of lager. He he he! Wait till I wait. Richie, good God! I never ate. You know. With hanging head, he marches doggedly forward. The navvy lurching by gores him with his flaming pronghorn. Richie, with a cry of pain, his hand to his back. Ah! Brights, lights. Bloom points to the navvy. A spy. Don't attract attention. I hate stupid crowds. I am not on pleasure bent. I am in a grave predicament. Mrs. Breen. Humbugging and delothering, as per usual with your cock and bull story. Bloom. I want to tell you a little secret about how I came to be here, but you must never tell, not even Molly. I have a most particular reason. Mrs. Breen, all agog. Oh, not for worlds. Bloom. Uh, let's walk on, shall us? Mrs. Breen. Let's. The bod makes an unheeded sign. Bloom walks on with Mrs. Breen. The terrier follows, whining piteously, wagging his tail. The bod. Jewman's melt. Bloom. In an oatmeal sporting suit, a sprig of woodbine in the lapel, tony buff shirt, shepherd's plaid St. Andrew's cross scarf tie, white spats, fawn dust coat on his arm, tawny red brogues, field glasses in bandolier, and a grey billycock hat. Do you remember a long, long time, years and years ago, just after Millie, marionette we called her, was weaned when we all went together to fairy house races, was it? Mrs. Breen, in smart sacks, tailor-made, white velours hat and spider veil. Leopardstown. Bloom. I mean Leopardstown, and Molly won seven shillings on a three-year-old named Nevertell. And coming home, along by Fox Rock, in that old five-seater chandradan of a wagonette, you were in your heyday then, and you had on that new hat of white velours with a surround of mole fur that mrs hayes advised you to buy because it was marked down to nineteen and eleven a bit of wire and an old rag of velveteen and i'll lay you what you like she did it on purpose mrs breen she did of course the cat don't tell me nice adviser bloom because it didn't suit you one quarter as well as the other ducky little tammy tongue with the bird of paradise wing in it that I admired on you, and you honestly looked just too fetching in it, though it was a pity to kill it, you cruel, naughty creature, little mite of a thing with a heart the size of a full stop. Mrs. Breen squeezes his arm, simpers. Naughty, cruel I was. Bloom, low, secretly, ever more rapidly. And Molly was eating a sandwich of spiced beef out of Mrs. Joe Gallagher's lunch basket. Frankly, though she had her advisers or admirers, I never cared much for her style. She was Mrs. Breen. Too. Bloom. Yes. And Molly was laughing because Rogers and Maggot O'Reilly were mimicking a cock as we passed a farmhouse, and Marcus Tertius Moses, the tea merchant, drove past us in a gig with his daughter, Dancer Moses was her name, and the poodle in her lap bridled up, and you asked me if I ever heard or read or knew or came across... Mrs. Breen eagerly, yes, 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 yes. She fades from his side. Followed by the whining dog, he walks on towards Hellsgate. 
In an archway, a standing woman bent forward, her feet apart, pisses, cowily. Outside a shuttered pub, a bunch of loiterers listen to a tale which their broken-snouted gaffer rasps out with raucous humor. An armless pair of them flop wrestling, growling in maimed, sodden play-fight. The gaffer crouches, his voice twisted in his snout. And when Cairns came down from the scaffolding in Beaver Street, what was he after doing it unto only into the bucket of porter that was there waiting on the shavings for Derwin's plasterers? The loiterers could fall with cleft pallets. Oh, jays! Their paint-speckled hats wag. Spattered with the size and lime of their lodges, they frisk limblessly about him. Bloom. Coincidence, too. They think it funny. Anything but that. Broad daylight. Trying to walk. Lucky no woman. The loiterers. Jays. That's a good one. Glauber salts. Oh, jays. Into the men's porter. Bloom passes, cheap whores, singly, coupled, shawled, dishevelled, call from lanes, doors, corners. The whores. Are you going far, queer fellow? How's your middle leg? Got a match on you? Hey, come here till I stiffen it for you. He plodges through their sump toward the lighted street beyond. From a bulge of window curtains a gramophone rears a battered brazen trunk. In the shadow a shebean keeper haggles with the navvy and the two redcoats. The navvy belching. Where's the bloody house? The shebean keeper. Purden Street, shilling a bottle of stout, respectable woman. The navvy, gripping the two red coats, staggers forward with them. Come on, you, you British army. Private car behind his back. He ain't half balmy. Private Compton laughs. What ho? Private car to the navvy. Portobello Barracks Canteen. You ask for car. Just car. The navvy shouts. We are the boys of Wexford. Private Compton. Say, what price the sergeant major? Private car. Bennett? He's my pal. I love old Bennett. The navvy shouts. The galling chain and free our native land. He staggers forward, dragging them with him. Bloom stops at fault. The dog approaches, his tongue out lolling, panting. Bloom. Wild goose chase this. Disorderly houses. Lord knows where they are gone. Drunks cover distance double quick. Nice mix-up. Seen at Westland Row. Then jump in first class with third ticket. Then too far. Train with engine behind. Might have taken me to Malahide or a siding for the night or a collision. Second drink does it. Once is a dose. What am I following him for? Still, if I hadn't heard about Mrs. Beaufoy Purifoy, I wouldn't have gone and wouldn't have met Kismet. He'll lose that cash. Relieving office here. Good biz for cheap jacks, organs. What do you lack? Soon got, soon gone. Might have lost my life, too, with that mangong wheel-track trolley glare juggernaut. Only for presence of mind. Can't always save you, though. If I had passed Trulock's window that day, two minutes later would have been shot. Absence of body. Still, if bullet only went through my coat, get damages for shock. Five hundred pounds. What was he? Kildare Street Club Toff? God help his gamekeeper. He gazes ahead, reading on the wall a scrawled chalk legend, Wet Dream and a Phallic Design. Odd. Molly drawing on the frosted carriage pane at Kingstown. What's that like? Gaudy doll women loll in the lighted doorways, in window embrasures, smoking bird's eye cigarettes. The odor of the sick sweet weed floats towards him in slow round ovaling reeds. The reeds. Sweet are the sweets, sweets of sin. Bloom. My spine's a bit limp. Go or turn, and this food? Eat it and get all pig-sticky? Absurd I am. Waste of money. One and eight pence too much. The retriever drives a cold, snivelling muzzle against his hand, wagging his tail. Strange how they take to me. Even that brute today. Better speak to him first, like they like rencontre. Stinks like a polecat. 
Checkum son gout. He might be mad. Dog days. Uncertain in his movements. Good fellow, Fido. Good fellow, Gary Owen. The wolf-dog sprawls on his back, wriggling obscenely with begging paws, his long black tongue lolling out. Influence of his surroundings. Uh, give and have done with it, provided nobody. Calling encouraging words, he shambles back with a furtive poacher's tread, dogged by the setter, into a dark, stale-stunk corner. He unrolls one parcel and goes to dump the crubeen softly, but holds back and feels the trotter. Sizable for a threepence. But then I have it in my left hand. Calls for more effort. Why? Smaller from want of use. Oh, let it slide. Two and six. With regret, he lets the unrolled crubeen and trotter slide. The mastiff mauls the bundle clumsily and gluts himself with growling greed, crunching the bones. Two rain-caped watch approach, silent, vigilant. They murmur together, the watch. Bloom, of bloom, for bloom, bloom. Each lays hand on Bloom's shoulder. First watch. Caught in the act. Commit no nuisance. Bloom stammers. I, I am doing good to others. A covey of gulls, storm petrels, rises hungrily from liffy slime with banbury cakes in their beaks. The gulls. Caw, cave, cankery, cake. Bloom. The friend of man, trained by kindness. He points. Bob Duran, toppling from a high bar stool, sways over the munching spaniel. Bob Duran. Tell, sir, give us the paw. Give the paw. The bulldog growls, his scruff standing, a goblet of pig's knuckle between his molars, through which rabid scumspittle dribbles. Bob Duran falls silently into an area. Second watch. Prevention of cruelty to animals. Bloom enthusiastically. A noble work! I scolded the tram-driver on Harold's Cross Bridge for elusing the poor horse with his harness scab. Bad French I got for my pains. Of course it was frosty in the last tram. All tales of circus life are highly demoralizing. Signor Maffei, passion pale, in lion tamer's costume with diamond studs in his shirt front, steps forward holding a circus paper hoop a curling carriage whip and a revolver with which he covers the gorging boarhound signor maffei with a sinister smile ladies and gentlemen my educated greyhound it was i broke in the bucking bronco ajax with my patent spiked saddle for carnivores lash under the belly with a knotted thong block tackle and a strangling pulley will bring your lion to heel no matter how fracked even Leo Ferox there, the Libyan man-eater. A red-hot crowbar and some niniment rubbing on the burning part produced Fritz of Amsterdam, the thinking hyena. He glares. I possess the Indian sign. The glint of my eye does it with these breast sparklers. With a bewitching smile. I now introduce Mademoiselle Ruby, the pride of the ring. First watch. Come, name and address. Bloom. I have forgotten for the moment. Ah, oh, yes. He takes off his high-grade hat, saluting. Dr. Bloom, Leopold, dental surgeon. You have heard of von Bloom Pasha? Umpteen millions. Donner Wetter owns half Austria, Egypt. Cousin. First watch. Proof. A card falls from inside the leather headband of Bloom's hat. Bloom. In red fez, Cadi's dress coat with broad green sash, wearing a false badge of the Legion of Honor, picks up the card hastily and offers it. Allow me. My club is the Junior Army and Navy. Solicitors, Messieurs. John Henry Menton, 27 Bachelor's Walk. First watch. Reads. Henry Flower, no fixed abode, unlawfully watching and besetting. Second watch. An alibi, you are cautioned. Bloom produces from his heart pocket a crumpled yellow flower. This is the flower in question. It was given me by a man I don't know his name. Plausibly. You know that old joke, Rose of Castile? Bloom. <laughs> the change of name? Virag. 
he murmurs privately and confidentially. We are engaged, you see, Sergeant, lady in the case, love entanglement. He shoulders the second watch gently. Dash it all. It's a way we gallants have in the navy, uniform that does it. He turns gravely to the first watch. Still, of course, you do get your Waterloo sometimes. Drop in some evening and have a glass of old Burgundy. To the second watch, gaily. I'll introduce you, Inspector. She's game. Do it in the shake of a lamb's tail. A dark, mercurialized face appears, leading a veiled figure. The dark Mercury. The castle is looking for him. He was drummed out of the army. Martha, thick-veiled, a crimson halter round her neck, a copy of the Irish Times in her hand, in tone of reproach, pointing. Henry, Leopold, Lionel, thou lost one, clear my name. First watch, sternly. Come to the station. Bloom, scared, hats himself, steps back. Then, plucking at his heart and lifting his right forearm on the square, he gives the sign and dugard of fellowcraft. No, no, worshipful master, light of love, mistaken identity, the lion's mail, Le Surex and Dubosc. You remember the child's fratricide case? We, medical men, by striking him dead with a hatchet. I am wrongfully accused. Better one guilty escape than ninety-nine wrongfully condemned. Martha, sobbing behind her veil, breach of promise my real name is peggy griffin he wrote to me that he was miserable i'll tell my brother the bective rug a full back on you heartless flirt bloom behind his hand she's drunk the woman is inebriated he murmurs vaguely the pass of ephraim shit belief second watch tears in his eyes to bloom you ought to be thoroughly well ashamed of yourself bloom gentlemen of the jury let me explain a pure mare's nest i'm a man misunderstood i am being made a scapegoat of i am a respectable married man without a stain on my character i live in eccles street my wife and i the daughter of a most distinguished commander a gallant upstanding gentleman what do you call him major general brian tweedy one of britain's fighting men who helped to win our battles got his majority for the heroic defence of rourke's drift First watch. Regiment. Bloom turns to the gallery. The Royal Dublins, boys, the salt of the earth, known the world over. I think I see some old comrades in arms up there among you. The R.D.F. with your own metropolitan police, guardians of our homes, the pluckiest lads and the finest body of men as physique in the service of our sovereign. A voice. Turn coat. Up the boars. Who booed Joe Chamberlain? Bloom, his hand on the shoulder of the first watch. My old dad, too, was a J.P. I'm as staunch a Britisher as you are, sir. I fought with the colors for king and country in the absent-minded war under General Goh in the park, and was disabled at Spy and Cop and Blowham Fontaine, was mentioned in dispatches. I did all a white man could, with quiet feeling. Jim Bloodso, hold her nozzle against the bank. First watch. Profession or trade? Bloom. Well, I follow a literary occupation, author, journalist. In fact, we are just bringing out a collection of prize stories of which I am the inventor, something that is an entirely new departure. I am connected with the British and Irish press. If you ring up... Miles Crawford strides out jerkily, a quill between his teeth. His scarlet beak blazes with the aureole of his straw hat. He dangles a hank of Spanish onions in one hand and holds with the other hand a telephone receiver nozzle to his ear. Miles Crawford. His cock swattles wagging. Hello, 7784. Hello. Free men's urinal and weekly arsewipe here. Paralyzed Europe. You which? Blue bags. Who writes? Is it Bloom? Mr. Philip Bufoy, pale-faced, stands in the witness box in accurate morning dress, outburst pocket with peak of handkerchief showing creased lavender trousers and patent boots. He carries a large portfolio labeled Matcham's Masterstrokes. Bufoy drawls. No, you aren't. Not by a long shot, if I know it. I don't see it, that's all. No born gentleman. 
no one with the most rudimentary promptings of a gentleman would stoop to such particularly loathsome conduct one of those my lord a plagiarist a soapy sneak masquerading as a literature it's perfectly obvious that with the most inherent baseness he has cribbed some of my best-selling copy really gorgeous stuff a perfect gem the love passages in which are beneath suspicion the beaufoy books of love and great possessions with which your lordship is doubtless familiar are a household word throughout the kingdom Bloom murmurs with hangdog meekness glum. That bit about the laughing witch hand in hand I take exception to, if I may. Beaufoy, his lip uncurled, smiles superciliously on the court. You funny ass, you. You're too beastly awful weird for words. I don't think you need over-excessively disincommodate yourself in that regard. My literary agent, Mr. J. B. Pinker, is in attendance. I presume, my lord, we shall receive the usual witnesses' fees, shan't we? You are considerably out of pocket over this bally pressman Johnny, this Jack Dot Rhymes, who has not even been to a university. Bloom indistinctly. University of life, bad art. Beaufoy shouts, It's a damnably foul lie, showing the moral rottenness of the man. He extends his portfolio. We have here damning evidence, the corpus delicti, my lord, a specimen of my maturer work disfigured by the hallmark of the beast. A voice from the gallery. Moses, Moses, king of the Jews, wiped his arse in the daily news. Bloom bravely. Overdrawn. Beaufoy. You low cad, you ought to be ducked in the horse pond, you rotter. To the court. Why, look at the man's private life, leading a quadruple existence, street angel and house devil not fit to be mentioned in mixed society the arch conspirator of the age bloom to the court and he a bachelor how first watch the king versus bloom call the woman driscoll the crier mary driscoll scullery maid mary driscoll a slipshod servant girl approaches she has a bucket on the crook of her arm and a scouring brush in her hand second watch another are you of the unfortunate class mary driscoll indignantly i'm not a bad one i bear a respectable character and was four months in my last place i was in a situation six pounds a year and my chances with fridays out and i had to leave owing to his carryings on first watch what do you tax him with mary driscoll he made a certain suggestion, but I thought more of myself, poor as I am. Bloom, in house jacket of ripple cloth, flannel trousers, heelless slippers, unshaven, his hair rumpled, softly. What treated you white? I gave you mementos, smart emerald garters, far above your station. Incautiously I took your part when you were accused of pilfering. There's a medium in all things. Play cricket. Mary Driscoll excitedly. As God is looking down on me this night, if ever I laid a hand to them oilsters. First watch. The offence complained of? Did something happen? Mary Driscoll. He surprised me in the rear of the premises, Your Honour, when the missus was out shopping one morning with a request for a safety pin. He held me, and I was discoloured in four places as a result, and he interfered twice with my clothing. Bloom. She counter-assaulted. Mary Driscoll scornfully. I had more respect for the scouring brush, so I had. I remonstrated him, your lord, and he remarked, Keep it quiet. General laughter. End of Ulysses 15a Recorded by Anita Roy Dobbs, San Francisco, June 2006
Ulysses 15, B. The Second of Seven Parts. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ulysses by James Joyce. 15, B. George Fottrell, Clerk of the Crown and Peace, resonantly. Order in court. The accused will now make a bogus statement. Bloom, pleading not guilty and holding a full-blown water-lily, begins a long, unintelligible speech. They would hear what counsel had to say in his stirring address to the grand jury. He was down and out, but, though branded as a black sheep, if he might say so, he meant to reform, to retrieve the memory of the past in a purely sisterly way, and return to nature as a purely domestic animal. A seven-months child, he had been carefully brought up and nurtured by an aged bedridden parent. There might have been lapses of an erring father, but he wanted to turn over a new leaf, and now, when at long last in sight of the whipping post, to lead a homely life in the evening of his days, permeated by the affectionate surroundings of the heaving bosom of the family. An acclimatized Britisher, he had seen that summer eve from the footplate of an engine cab of the Loop Line Railway Company, while the rain refrained from falling glimpses, as it were, through the windows of loveful households in Dublin City and urban district of scenes, truly rural, of happiness, of the better land, with Drockwell's wallpaper at one and ninepence a dozen, innocent British-born bairns lisping prayers to the sacred infant, youthful scholars grappling with their pensums or model young ladies playing on the pianoforte, or anon all with fervour reciting the family rosary round the crackling yule log while in the boreens and green lanes the colleens with their swains strolled what times the strains of the organ-toned melodeon britannia metal bound with four acting stops and twelvefold bellows a sacrifice greatest bargain ever renewed laughter he mumbles incoherently reporters complain that they cannot hear long hand and short hand without looking up from their notebooks loosen his boots professor McHugh, from the press table coughs and calls cough it up man get it out in bits the cross-examination proceeds re bloom and the bucket a large bucket bloom himself bowel trouble in beaver street gripe yes quite bad a plasterer's bucket by walking stiff-legged suffered untold misery deadly agony about noon love or burgundy yes some spinach crucial moment he did not look in the bucket nobody rather a mess not completely a titbit's back number uproar and cat calls bloom in a torn frock coat stained with whitewash dinged silk hat sideways on his head a strip of sticking plaster across his nose talks inaudibly j j o'malley in barrister's grey wig and stuff gown, speaking with a voice of pained protest. This is no place for indecent levity at the expense of an erring mortal disguised in liquor. We are not in a beer garden, nor at an Oxford rag, nor is this a travesty of justice. My client is an infant, a poor foreign immigrant who started scratch as a stowaway, and is now trying to turn an honest penny. The trumped-up misdemeanor was due to a momentary aberration of heredity, brought on by hallucination, such familiarities as the alleged guilty occurrence being quite permitted in my client's native place, the land of the pharaoh. Prima facie, I put it to you, that there was no attempt at carnally knowing Intimacy did not occur, and the offence complained of by Driscoll, that her virtue was solicited, was not repeated. I would deal in especial with atavism. There have been cases of shipwreck and somnambulism in my client's family. If the accused could speak, he could a tale unfold, one of the strangest that have ever been narrated between the covers of a book. He himself, my lord, is a physical wreck from cobbler's weak chest. His submission is that he is of Mongolian extraction and irresponsible for his actions. Not all there, in fact. Bloom 
barefoot, pigeon-breasted, in lasser's vest and trousers, apologetic toes turned in, opens his tiny mole's eyes and looks about him dazedly, passing a slow hand across his forehead. Then he hitches his belt sailor fashion and with a shrug of oriental obeisance salutes the crowd, pointing one thumb heavenward. Him makey veely moochy fine night. He begins to lilt simply. Lily poo little child, blingy pigfoot every night, pay to shilly. He is howled down, J. J. O'Malley, hotly to the populace. This is a lone hand fight. By Hades, I will not have any client of mine gagged and badgered in this fashion by a pack of curs and laughing hyenas. The Mosaic Code has superseded the law of the jungle. I say it, and I say it emphatically, without wishing for one moment to defeat the ends of justice. Accused was not accessory before the act, and prosecutrix has not been tampered with. The young person was treated by defendant as if she were his very own daughter. Bloom takes J. J. O'Malley's hand and raises it to his lips. I shall call rebutting evidence to prove up to the hilt that the hidden hand is again at its own game. When in doubt, persecute Bloom. My client, an innately bashful man, would be last man in the world to do anything ungentlemanly, which injured modesty could object to, or cast a stone at a girl who took the wrong turning when some dastard responsible for her condition had worked his own sweet will on her. He wants to go straight. I regard him as the whitest man I know. He is down on his luck at present owing to the mortgaging of his extensive property in the Agandath Natam in faraway Asia Minor, slides of which will now be shown to bloom i suggest that you will do the handsome thing bloom a penny in the pound the image of the lake of canareth with blurred cattle cropping in silver haze is projected on the wall moses douglas ferret-eyed albino in blue dungarees stands up in the gallery holding in each hand an orange citron and a pork kidney Luggaz Horsley Bleibtraustrasse, Berlin, W. 13. J. J. O'Malley steps on to a low plinth and holds the lapel of his coat with solemnity. His face lengthens, grows pale and bearded with sunken eyes, the blotches of phthisis and hectic cheekbones of John F. Taylor. He applies his handkerchief to his mouth and scrutinizes the galloping tide of rose-pink blood. J. J. O'Malley, almost voiceless. Excuse me, I am suffering from a severe chill. I have recently come from a sick bed. A few well-chosen words. He assumes the avine head, foxy moustache, and proboscidal eloquence of Seymour Bush. When the angel's book comes to be opened, if aught that the pensive bosom is inaugurated and soul transfigured and of soul transfiguring deserves to live, I say, accord the prisoner at the bar the sacred benefit of the doubt. A paper with something written on it is handed into court. Bloom, in court dress. Can give best references. Messrs. Callan Coleman. Mr. Wisdom Healy, J.P., my old chief Joe Cuff, Mr. V. B. Dillon, ex-Lord Mayor of Dublin, I have moved in the charmed circle of the highest Queens of Dublin society. Carelessly. I was just chatting this afternoon at the Viceregal Lodge to my old pals, Sir Robert and Lady Ball, Astronomer Royal at the Levee. Sir Bob, I said. Mrs. Yelverton Berry in low corsaged opal ball dress with elbow length ivory gloves wearing a sable trimmed brick quilted dolman a comb of brilliance and panache of osprey in her hair arrest him constable he wrote me an anonymous letter in pretense backhand when my husband was in the north riding of tipperary in the munster circuit signed james lovebirch he said that he had seen from the gods my peerless globes as i sat in the box of the theatre real at a command performance of la quigale 
I deeply inflamed him, he said. He made improper overtures to me to misconduct myself at half-past four p.m. on the following Thursday, Dunsink time. He offered to send me through the post a work of fiction by Monsieur Paul de Coq, entitled The Girl with the Three Pairs of Stays. Mrs. Bellingham, in cap and seal coney mantle, wrapped up to the nose, steps out of her brougham, and scans through tortoise-shell quizzing-glasses, which she takes from inside her huge opossum muff. Also to me, yes, I believe it is the same objectionable person, because he closed by a carriage door outside Sir Thorny Stoker's one sleety day through the cold snap of February ninety-three, when even the grid of the waste-pipe and the ball-stop of my bath-cistern were frozen. Subsequently he enclosed a bloom of edelweiss, culled on the heights, as he said, in my honour. I had it examined by a botanical expert, and elicited the information that it was a blossom of the home-grown potato-plant purloined from a forcing case of the model farm. Mrs. Yelverton Berry Shame on him! A crowd of sluts and ragamuffins surges forward the sluts and ragamuffins screaming, "'Stop, thief! Hurrah there, blue beard! Three cheers for Ike Mo. Second watch produces handcuffs. "'Here are the Darbies.' Mrs. Bellingham. "'He addressed me in several handwritings with fulsome compliments as a Venus in furs and alleged profound pity for my frost-bound coachman Palmer, while in the same breath he expressed himself as envious of his ear-flaps and fleecy sheepskins and of his fortunate proximity to my person when standing behind my chair wearing my livery with the armorial bearings of the Bellington Escutcheon garnished sable. A buck's head coped or he lauded almost extravagantly my nether extremities my swelling calves and silk hose drawn up to the limit and eulogized glowingly my other hidden treasures in priceless lace which he said he could conjure up he urged me stating that he felt it his mission in life to urge me to defile the marriage bed to commit adultery at the earliest possible opportunity the Honourable Mrs. Mervyn Talboys, in Amazon costume, hard hat, jack boots, cocksbird, vermilion waistcoat, fawn musketeer, gauntlets, and braided drums, long train held up and hunting crop with which she strikes her welt constantly. Also me, because he saw me on the polo ground of the Phoenix Park at the match, all Ireland versus the rest of Ireland. My eyes, I know, shone divinely as I watched Captain Slogger Denny of the Inniskillings, win the final chucker. On his darling cob, centaur, this plebeian Don Juan observed me from behind the hackney car and sent me in double envelopes in obscene photograph, such as are sold after dark on Paris boulevards, insulting to any lady. I have it still. It represents a partially nude signorita, frail and lovely, his wife, as he solemnly assured me, taken by him from nature practising illicit intercourse with a muscular torero, evidently a blackguard, he urged me to do likewise, to misbehave, to sin with officers of the garrison. He implored me to soil his letter in an unspeakable manner, to chastise him as he richly deserves, to bestride and ride him, to give him a most vicious horsewhipping. Mrs. Bellingham. Me too. Mrs. Yelverton Berry. Me too. Several highly respectable Dublin ladies hold up improper letters received from Bloom. The Honourable Mrs. Mervy Talboys stamps her jingling spurs in a sudden paroxysm of fury. I will, by the God above me. I scorch the pigeon-livered cur as long as I can stand over him. I'll flay him alive. Bloom, his eyes closing, quails expectantly. Here? He squirms. Again? He pants, cringing. I love the danger. The Honourable Mrs. Mervyn Talboys. Very much so. I'll make it hot for you. I'll make you dance, Jack Latin, for that. Mrs. Bellingham. Tan his breech well, the upstart. Write the stars and stripes on it. Mrs. Yelverton Berry. Disgraceful. There's no excuse for him. A married man. Bloom. All these 
people, I only meant the spanking idea, a warm, tingly glow without effusion, refined birching to stimulate the circulation. The Honourable Mrs. Mervyn Talboys laughs derisively. Oh, did you, my fine fellow? Well, by the living God, you'll get the surprise of your life. Now believe me, the most unmerciful hiding a man ever bargained for. You have lashed the dormant tigress in my nature into fury. Mrs. Bellingham shakes her muff and quizzing glasses vindictively. Make him smart, Hannah dear. Give him ginger. Thrash the mongrel within an inch of his life. The cat and nine tails geld him, vivisect him. Bloom, shuddering, shrinking, joins his hands with hangdong mien. Oh, cold, oh, shivery. It was your ambrosial beauty. Forgive, forgive, kismet. Let me off this once. He offers the other cheek. Mrs. Yelverton Berry severely. Don't do so on any account, Mrs. Talboys. He should be soundly trounced. The Honourable Mrs. Mervyn Talboys, unbuttoning her gauntlet violently. I'll do no such thing, pig dog, and always was ever since he was pupped, to dare address me i'll flog him black and blue in the public streets i'll dig my spurs in him to the rowl he is a well-known cuckold she swishes her hunting crop savagely in the air take down his trousers without loss of time come here sir quick ready bloom trembling beginning to obey the weather has been so warm Davy Stevens, ringleted, passes with a bevy of barefoot newsboys. Davy Stevens. Messenger of the Sacred Heart, an evening telegraph with St. Patrick's Day supplement, containing the new address of all the cuckolds in Dublin. The very Reverend Ken O'Hanlon, in cloth of gold cope, elevates and exposes a marble timepiece. Before him, Father Conroy and the Reverend John Hughes J. bend low. The timepiece. Unportaling. Cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo. The brass quoits of a bed are heard to jingle. Jig, jag, jig, 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 jag. A panel of fog rolls back rapidly, revealing rapidly in the jury box the faces of Martin Cunningham, Foreman, Silk Hatted, Jack Power, Simon Dedalus, Tom Kernan, Ned Lambert, John Henry Menton, Miles Crawford, Lenahan, Paddy Leonard, Nosy Flynn, McCoy, and the featureless face of a nameless one. The nameless one. Bareback riding, wait for age, gob. He organized her. The jurors, all their heads turned to his voice. Really? The nameless one snarls. Arse over tip, hundred shillings to five. The jurors, all their heads lowered in assent. Most of us thought as much. First watch. He is a marked man, another girl's plate cut, wanted, Jack the Ripper, a thousand pounds reward. Second watch, awed, whispers, and in black, a Mormon anarchist. The crier, loudly, whereas Leopold Bloom, of no fixed abode, is a well-known dynamitard, forger, bigamist, bawd, and cuckold, and a public nuisance to the citizens of Dublin. And whereas at this commission of assizes the most honourable... His honour, Sir Frederick Falconer, recorder of Dublin, in judicial garb of grey stone, rises from the bench, stone-bearded. He bears in his arms an umbrella scepter. From his forehead arise starkly the mosaic ram's horns. The recorder. I will put an end to this white slave traffic and rid Dublin of this odious pest. Scandalous. He dons the black cap. Let him be taken. Mr. Subsheriff from the dock where he now stands, and detained in custody in Mountjoy prison during his majesty's pleasure, and there be hanged by the neck until he is dead, and therein fail not at your peril, or may the Lord have mercy on your soul, remove him. A black skull-cap descends upon his head. The sub-sheriff, Long John Fanning, appears, smoking a pungent Henry Clay. Long John Fanning scowls and calls with rich rolling utterance. 
Who'll hang Judas Iscariot? H. Rumbold, Master Barber, in a blood-coloured jerkin and tanner's apron, a rope coiled over his shoulder, mounts the block. A life-preserver and a nail-studded bludgeon are stuck in his belt. He rubs grimly his grappling hands, knobbed with knuckle-dusters. Rumbold, to the recorder with sinister familiarity. Hanging Harry, Your Majesty, the mercy terror. Five guineas a jugular, neck or nothing. The bells of George's church toll slowly, loud, dark iron. The bells. Hi ho, hi ho. Bloom desperately. Wait, stop, gulls, good heart, I saw, innocence, girl in the monkey house, zoo. Lewd chimpanzee, breathlessly, pelvic basin, her artless blush unmanned me, overcome with emotion. I left the precincts. He turns to a figure in the crowd, appealing. Hines, may I speak to you? You know me. That three shillings you can keep. If you want a little more... Hines, coldly, you are a perfect stranger. Second watch points to the corner. The bomb is here. First watch infernal machine with a time fuse bloom no no pig's feet i was at a funeral first watch draws his truncheon liar the beagle lifts his snout showing the grey scorbutic face of paddy dignam he has gnawed all he exhales a putrid carcass-fed breath he grows to human size and shape his dachshund coat becomes a brown mortuary habit his green eyes flash bloodshot. Half of one ear, all the nose, and both thumbs are ghoul-eaten. Paddy Dignam, in a hollow voice. It is true it was my funeral. Dr. Finucane pronounced life extinct when I succumbed to the disease from natural causes. He lifts his mutilated ashen face moonwards and bays lugubriously, bloom in triumph. You hear? Paddy Dignam. Bloom, I am Paddy Dignam's spirit. List, list, oh, list. Bloom. The voice is the voice of Esau. Second watch blesses himself. How is that possible? First watch. It is not in the penny catechism. Paddy Dignam. By metempsychosis spooks. A voice. Oh, rocks, Paddy Dignam, earnestly. Once I was in the employ of Mr. J. H. Menton, solicitor, commissioner for oaths and affidavits of 27 Bachelor's Walk. Now I am defunct. The wall of the heart hypertrophied. Hard lines. The poor wife was awfully cut up. How is she bearing it? Keep her off, fat bottle of sherry. He looks round him. A lamp. I must satisfy an animal need. That buttermilk didn't agree with me. The portly figure of John O'Connell, caretaker, stands forth, holding a bunch of keys tied with crepe. Beside him stands Father Coffey, chaplain, toad-bellied, wry-necked, in a surplice and bandana nightcap, holding sleepily a staff of twisted poppies. Father Coffoy yawns, then chants with a hoarse croak. Nemine, Jacobs, full biscuits, amen. John O'Connell foghorn stormily through his megaphone. Dignam, Patrick T., deceased. Paddy Dignam, with pricked-up ears, winces. Overtones. He wriggles forward and places an ear to the ground. My master's voice. John O'Connell. Burial docket letter number UP 85,000. Field 17. House of Keys. Plot 101. Paddy Dignam listens with visible effort, thinking, his tail stiff-pointed, his ears cocked. Paddy Dignam. Pray for the repose of his soul. He worms down through a coal hole, his brown habit trailing its tether over rattling pebbles. 
After him toddles an obese grandfather rat on fungus turtle paws under a grey carapace. Dignam's voice muffled is heard baying underground. Dignam's dead and gone below. Tom Roqueford, robin red-breasted, in cap and breeches, jumps from his two-columned machine. Tom Roqueford, a hand to his breastbone, bows. Reuben J. A. Florin, I find him. He fixes the manhole with a resolute stare. My turn now. Follow me up to Carlo. He executes a daredevil salmon leap in the air and is engulfed in the coal hole. Two discs on the columns wobble, eyes of naught. All recedes. Bloom plodges forward again through the sump. Kisses chirp amid the rifts of fog. A piano sounds. He stands before a lighted house, listening. The kisses, winging from their bowers, fly about him, twittering, warbling, cooing. The kisses, warbling. Leo. Twittering. Icky licky micky sticky for Leo. Cooing. Coo, coo, coo. Yum, yum. Wum, wum. Warbling. Big, come big. Pirouette. Leopold, pold. Twittering. Leo, Lee. Warbling. Oh, Leo. They rustle flutter upon his garments, a light, bright, giddy flex, silvery sequins. Bloom. A man's touch, sad music, church music, perhaps here. Zoe Higgins, a young whore in a sapphire slip, closed with three bronze buckles, a slim black velvet fillet around her throat, nods, trips down the steps, and accosts him. Zoe. Are you looking for someone? He's inside, with his friend. Bloom. Is this Mrs. Max? Zoe. No, 81, Mrs. Cowens. You might go farther and fare worse. Mother Slipper Slapper. Familiarly. She's on the job herself tonight with the vet, her tipster, and gives her all the winners and pays for her son in Oxford, working overtime, but her luck's turned today. Suspiciously. You're not his father, are you? Bloom. Not I. Zoe. You both in black. Has little mousy any chickles tonight? His skin, alert, feels her fingertips approach. A hand glides over his left thigh. Zoe. How's the nuts? Bloom. Offside, curiously, they are on the right. Heavier, I suppose. One in a million my tailor, Messius, says. Zoe, in sudden alarm. You've a hard chanker. Bloom. Not likely. Zoe. I feel it. Her hand slides into his left trouser pocket and brings out a hard black shriveled potato. She regards it and Bloom with dumb moist lips. Bloom. A talisman. Heirloom. Zoe. For Zoe? For keeps? For being so nice, eh? She puts the potato greedily into a pocket, then links his arm, cuddling him with supple warmth. He smiles uneasily. Slowly, note by note, oriental music is played. He gazes in the tawny crystal of her eyes, ringed with coho. His smile softens. Zoe. You'll know me the next time. Bloom forlornly. I never loved a dear gazelle, but it was sure to... Gazelles are leaping, feeding on the mountains. Near are lakes. Round their shores file shadows black of cedar groves. Aroma rises, a strong hair growth of resin. It burns the orient, a sky of sapphire, cleft by the bronze flight of eagles. Under it lies the woman city, nude, white, still, cool, in luxury. A fountain murmurs among damask roses. Mammoth roses murmur of scarlet wine grapes. A wine of shame lust blood exudes, strangely murmuring. Zoe, murmuring sing song with the music, her odalisk lips lusciously smeared with salve of swine fat and rose water. Skorakan iwenawak, benoith hirushalom. Bloom fascinated. I thought you were of good stock by your accent. Zoe. And you know what thought did? 
She bites his ear gently with little gold-stopped teeth, sending on him a cloying breath of stale garlic. The roses draw apart, disclose a sepulchre of the gold of kings and their mouldering bones. Bloom draws back, mechanically caressing her right bub with a flat, awkward hand. Are you a Dublin girl? Zoe catches a stray hair deftly and twists it into her coil. No bloody fear, I'm English. Have you a swagger root? Bloom, as before. Rarely smoke, dear. Cigars now and then. Childish device. Lewdly. The mouth can be better engaged than with a cylinder of rank weed. Zoe. Go on, make a stump speech out of it. Bloom. In workmen's corduroy overhauls, black gansey with red flowing tie and Apache cap. Mankind is incorrigible. Sir Walter Raleigh brought from the New World that potato and that weed, the one a killer of pestilence by absorption, the other a poisoner of the ear, eye, heart, memory, will, understanding, all. That is to say, he brought the poison a hundred years before another person, whose name I forget, brought the food, suicide, lies, all our habits. Why, look at our public life. Midnight chimes from distant steeples, the chimes. Turn again, Leopold, Lord Mayor of Dublin. Bloom, in alderman's gown and chain. Electors of Aaron Quay, Inns Quay, Rotunda, Mountjoy, and North Dock, better run a tram line, I say, from the cattle mark to the river. That's the music of the future. That's my program. Qui bono? But our buccaneering Vanderdeckens in their phantom ship of finance... An elector. Three times three for our future chief magistrate. The aurora borealis of the torchlight procession leaps. The torchbearers. Hooray! Several well-known burgesses, city magnates and freemen of the city, shake hands with Bloom and congratulate him. Timothy Harrington, late thrice Lord Mayor of Dublin, imposing in mayoral scarlet, gold chain and white silk tie, confers with Councillor Lork and Sherlock locum tenens. They nod vigorously in agreement. Late Lord Mayor Harrington, in scarlet robe with mace, gold mayoral chain, and large white silk scarf. That alderman, Sir Leo Bloom's speech, be printed at the expense of the ratepayers, that the house in which he was born be ornamented with commemorative tablet, and that the thoroughfare hitherto known as Cow Parlor off Cork Street be henceforth designated Boulevard Bloom. Councillor Lork and Sherlock. Carried unanimously. Bloom impassionedly. These flying Dutchmen, or lying Dutchmen, as they recline in their upholstered poop, casting dice, what wreck they? Machines, is their cry, their chimera, their panacea. Labor-saving apparatuses, supplanters, bugbears, manufactured monsters for multiple murder, hideous hobgoblins produced by a horde of capitalistic lusts upon our prostituted labor. The poor man starves while they are grassing their royal mountain stags or shooting peasants or fartridges in their purblind pomp of pelf and power. But their reign is rover forever and ever and ever. Prolonged applause. Venetian masts, maypoles, and festal arches spring up. A streamer bearing the legend Cead Mille Failte and Mat Bob Melik Israel spans the street. All the windows are thronged with sightseers, chiefly ladies. Along the route, the regiments of the Royal Dublin Fusiliers, the King's Own Scottish Borderers, the Cameron Highlanders, and the Welsh Fusiliers standing to attention back the crowd. Boys from high school are perched on the lampposts, telegraph poles, window sills, cornices, gutters, chimney pots, railings, rain spouts, whistling and cheering. The pillar of the cloud appears. A fife and drum band is heard in the distance playing the coal nider. The beaters approach with imperial eagles hoisted, trailing banners and waving oriental palms. The crystal elephantine papal standards rises high, surrounded by pennons of the civic flag. The van of the procession appears headed by John Howard Parnell, city marshal, in a chessboard tabard, the Athlone Porcivant and Ulster King of Arms. They are followed by the Right Honourable Joseph Hutchinson, Lord Mayor of Dublin, his lordship the Lord Mayor of Cork, their worships the mayors of Limerick, Galway, Sligo, and Waterford, twenty-eight Irish representative peers, sirdars, grandees, and maharajas bearing the cloth of estate. The Dublin Metropolitan Fire Brigade, 
the chapter of the saints of finance in their plutocratic order of precedence the bishop of down and connor his eminence michael cardinal logue archbishop of armagh primate of all ireland his grace the most reverend dr william alexander archbishop of armagh primate of all ireland the chief rabbi the presbyterian moderator the heads of all the baptist anabaptist methodist and moravian chapels and the honorary secretary of the society of friends after the march the guilds and trades and train bands with flying colours coopers bird fanciers millwrights newspaper canvassers law scriveners masseurs vinters trussmakers chimney sweeps lard refiners tabinet and poplin weavers farriers italian warehousemen church decorators bootjack manufacturers undertakers silk mercers lapidaries salesmasters cork cutters assessors of fire losses dyers and cleaners export bottlers fellmongers ticket writers heraldic seal engravers horse repository hands bullion brokers cricket and archery outfitters riddle makers egg and potato factors hosiers and glovers plumbing contractors after the march gentlemen of the bedchamber black rod deputy garter gold stick the master of horse the lord great chamberlain the earl marshal the high constable carrying the sword of state st stephen's iron crown and chalice and bible four buglers on foot blow a senate beefeaters reply winding clarions of welcome under an arch of triumph bloom appears bareheaded in a crimson velvet mantle trimmed with ermine bearing st edward's staff the orb and sceptre with the dove the curtana he is seated on a milk-white horse with long flowing crimson tail richly caparisoned with golden headstall wild excitement the ladies from their balconies throw down rose petals the air is perfumed with essences the men cheer bloom's boys run amid the bystanders with branches of hawthorn and wren bushes bloom's boys the wren the wren the king of all birds st stephen's his day was caught in the firs a blacksmith murmurs for the honour of god and is that bloom he scarcely looks thirty-one a pavier and flagger that's the famous bloom now the world's greatest reformer hats off all uncover their heads women whisper eagerly a millionairess richly isn't he simply wonderful a noblewoman nobly all that man has seen a feminist masculinely and done a bell-hanger a classic face he has the forehead of a thinker bloom's weather a sunburst appears in the northwest the bishop of down and connor i here present your undoubted emperor president and king chairman the most serene and potent and very puissant ruler of this realm god save leopold the first all god save leopold the first bloom and dalmatic and purple mantle to the bishop of down and connor with dignity thanks somewhat eminent sir william archbishop of armagh in purple stock and shovel hat will you to your power cause law and mercy to be executed in all your judgments in ireland and territories thereunto belonging bloom placing his right hand on his testicles swears so may the creator deal with me all this i promise to do michael archbishop of armagh pours a cruise of hair oil over bloom's head gaudium magnum annuntio vobis habemus carnificum leopold patrick andrew david george be thou anointed bloom assumes a mantle of cloth of gold and puts on a ruby ring he ascends and stands on the stone of destiny the representative peers put on at the same time their twenty-eight crowns joy bells ring in christ church st patrick's george's and gay malahide myris bazaar fireworks go up from all sides with symbolical phallopyrotechnic designs the peers do homage one by one approaching and genuflecting the peers i do become your liege man of life and limb to earthly worship bloom holds up his right hand on which sparkles the koh-i-noor diamond his palfrey neighs immediate silence 
Wireless intercontinental and interplanetary transmitters are set for reception of message. Bloom. My subjects. We hereby nominate our faithful charger, Copula Felix, hereditary grand vizier, and announce that we have this day repudiated our former spouse and have bestowed our royal hand upon the princess Selina, the splendor of night. The former morganatic spouse of Bloom is hastily removed in the Black Mariah. The Princess Selina, in moon-blue robes, a silver crescent on her head, descends from a sedan chair borne by two giants. An outburst of cheering. John Howard Parnell raises the royal standard. Illustrious Bloom, successor to my famous brother. Bloom embraces John Howard Parnell. We thank you from our heart, John, for this right royal welcome to greet Erin, the promised land of our common ancestors. The freedom of the city is presented to him embodied in a charter. The keys of Dublin crossed on a crimson cushion are given to him. He shows all that he is wearing green socks. Tom Kernan. You deserve it, your honor. Bloom. On this day twenty years ago we overcame the hereditary enemy of Ladysmith. Our howitzers and camel-swivel guns played on his lines with telling effect. Half a league onward, they charge! All is lost now. Do we yield? No! We drive them headlong. Lo, we charge, deploying to the left. Our light horse swept across the heights of Plevna, and, uttering their war cry, Bonafide Sabaoth, sabred the Saracen gunners to a man. The Chapel of Freeman Typesetters. Here! Here! John Wise Nolan. There's the man that got away, James Stevens. A blue coat schoolboy. Bravo! An old resident. You're a credit to your country, sir. That's what you are. An apple woman. He's a man like Ireland wants. Bloom. My beloved subjects, a new era is about to dawn. I, Bloom. Tell you verily, it is even now at hand. Yea, on the word of a bloom, ye shall ere long enter into the golden city, which is to be the new bloom Muslim in the Nova Hibernia of the future. Thirty-two workmen wearing rosettes from all the counties of Ireland, under the guidance of Derwin the Builder, construct the new bloom Muslim. It is a colossal edifice with crystal roof, built in the shape of a huge pork kidney, containing forty thousand rooms. In the course of its extension several buildings and monuments are demolished. Government offices are temporarily transferred to railway sheds. Numerous houses are razed to the ground. The inhabitants are lodged in barrels and boxes, all marked in red with the letters L.B. Several paupers fall from a ladder. A part of the walls of Dublin, crowded with loyal sightseers, collapses. The sightseers, dying. Morituri te salutant. They die. A man in a brown mackintosh springs up through a trapdoor. He points an elongated finger at Bloom, the man in the mackintosh. Don't you believe a word he says? That man is Leopold Mantosh, the notorious fire-raiser. His real name is Higgins. Bloom. Shoot him, dog of a Christian. So much for Mantosh. A cannon shot. The man in the Macintosh disappears. Bloom, with his scepter, strikes down poppies. The instantaneous deaths of many powerful enemies, graziers, members of parliament, members of standing committees, are reported. Bloom's bodyguard distribute Mondi money, commemoration medals, Loaves and fishes, temperance badges, expensive Henry Clay cigars, free cowbones for soup, rubber preservatives in sealed envelopes tied with gold thread, butterscotch, pineapple rock, billets du in the form of cocked hats, ready-made suits, porringers of toad in the hole, bottles of J's fluid, purchase stamps, forty days indulgences, spurious coins, dairy-fed pork sausages, theatre passes, Season tickets available for all tram lines, coupons of the royal and privileged Hungarian lottery, penny dinner counters, cheap reprints of the world's twelve worst books, Froggy and Fritz, politic, care of the baby, infantilic, 
Fifty meals for seven slash six. Cullinick. Was Jesus a sun myth? Historic. Expel that pain. Medic. Infant's compendium of the universe. Cosmic. Let's all chortle. Hilaric. Canvassers vade mecum. Journalic. Love letters of mother assistant. Erotic. Who's who in space? Asterisk. Songs that reached our heart. Melodic. Pennywise's way to wealth. Parsimonic. A general rush and scramble. Women press forward to touch the hem of Bloom's robe. The lady Gwendolen Dubedat bursts through the throng, leaps on his horse and kisses him on both cheeks amid great acclamation. A magnesium flashlight photograph is taken. Babes and sucklings are held up. The women. Little father, little father. The babes and sucklings. Clap hands till Poldy comes home. Cakes in his pocket for Leo alone. Bloom bending down pokes baby Boardman gently in the stomach. Baby Boardman. Hiccups, curdled milk flowing from his mouth. Ha ya ya ya. Bloom, shaking hands with the blind stripling. My more than brother, placing his arms round the shoulder of an old couple. Dear old friends. He plays pussy four corners with ragged boys and girls. Peep, bo peep. He wheels twins in a perambulator. Tic tac too, would you set a shoe? He performs juggler's tricks, draws red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet silk handkerchiefs from his mouth. Rigib thirty two feet per second. He consoles a widow. Absence makes the heart grow younger. He dances the highland fling with grotesque antics. Leg it, ye devils! He kisses the policeman. You pee up, you pee up. He whispers in the ear of a blushing waitress and laughs kindly. <laughs> naughty, naughty. He eats a raw turnip offered him by Maurice Butterly, farmer. Fine, splendid. He refuses to accept three shillings offered him by Joseph Hines, journalist. My dear fellow, not at all. He gives his coat to a beggar. Please accept. He takes part in a stomach race with elderly male and female cripples. Come on, boys, wriggle it, girls. The citizen, choked with emotion, brushes aside a tear in his emerald muffler. May the good God bless him. The ram's horns sound for silence. The standard of Zion is hosted. Bloom. Uncloaks impressively, revealing obesity, unrolls a paper and reads solemnly. Aleph, Beth, Gimel, Daleth, Haggadah, Tefillin, Kosher, Yom, Kippur, Hanukkah, Rosh Hashanah, Beni, Brith, Bar, Mitzvah, Mazov, Azkenazm, Meshuga, Talith. An official translation is read by Jimmy Henry, assistant town clerk, Jimmy Henry. The court of conscience is now open. His most Catholic majesty will now administer open-air justice, free medical and legal advice, solution of doubles and other problems, all cordially invited, given at this our loyal city of Dublin, in the year one of the paradisiacal era. Paddy Leonard what am I to do about my rates and taxes? Bloom. Pay them, my friend. Paddy Leonard. Thank you. Nosy Flynn. Can I raise the mortgage on my fire insurance? Bloom. Obdurately. Sirs, take notice that by the law of torts you are bound over in your own recognizances for six months in the sum of five pounds. J. J. O'Molly. A Daniel, did I say? Nay, a Peter O'Brien! Nosy Flynn. Where do I draw the five pounds? Pisser Burke. For bladder trouble? Bloom. Acid, knit, hydrochlor, dill, twenty minims, tinct, nux, vom, five minims, extra, taraxel, lick, thirty minims, ac, dis, ter, in, die. Chris Callanan. What is the parallax of the subsolar ecliptic of Aldebaran? Bloom. Pleased to hear from you, Chris K. Eleven. Joe Hines. Why aren't you in uniform? Bloom. When my progenitor of sainted memory wore the uniform of Austrian despot in a dank prison, where was yours? Ben Dollard. Pansies. Bloom. Embellish. Beautify. Suburban gardens. Ben Dollard. When twins arrive? 
BLOOM. FATHER? POTTER. DAD. STARTS THINKING. LARRY O'ROURKE. An eight-day license for my new premises. You remember me, Sir Leo, when you were in number seven. I'm sending around a dozen of stout for the missus. Bloom, coldly. You have the advantage of me. Lady Bloom accepts no presents. Crofton. This is indeed a festivity. Bloom, solemnly. You call it a festivity. I call it a sacrament. Alexander Keyes. When will we have our own house of keys? Bloom. I stand for the reform of municipal morals and the plain Ten Commandments. New worlds for old. Union of all, Jew, Moslem, and Gentile. Three acres and a cow for all children of nature. Saloon motor hearses, compulsory manual labor for all. All parks open to the public day and night. Electric dish scrubbers. Tuberculosis, lunacy, war, and mendicancy must now cease. General amnesty, weekly carnival with masked license bonuses for all, Esperanto, the universal language with universal brotherhood. No more patriotism of bar spongers and dropsical impostors. Free money, free rent, free love, and a free lay church in a free lay state. O'Madden Burke. Free fox in a free hen roost. Davy Byrne, yawning. Bloom. Mixed races and mixed marriage. Lenahan. What about mixed bathing? End of Ulysses 15b. Recorded by Anita Roy Dobbs, San Francisco, June 2006. Ulysses, 15, C, the third of seven parts. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ulysses by James Joyce, 15, C. Bloom explains to those near him his schemes for social regeneration. All agree with him. The keeper of the Kildare Street Museum appears, dragging a lorry, on which are the shaking statues of several naked goddesses, Venus Calipyge, Venus Pendemos, Venus Metempsychosis, and plaster figures, also naked, representing the new nine muses, commerce, operatic music, amour, publicity, Manufacture, liberty of speech, plural voting, gastronomy, private hygiene, seaside concert entertainments, painless obstetrics, and astronomy for the people. Father Farley. He is an Episcopalian, an agnostic, an anything Arian, seeking to overthrow our holy faith. Mrs. Riordan tears up her will. I'm disappointed in you, you bad man. Mother Grogan removes her boot to throw it at Bloom. You beast, you abominable person. Nosy Flynn. Give us a tune, Bloom, one of the old sweet songs. Bloom, with rollicking humor, I vowed that I never would leave her. She turned out a cruel deceiver with my toodaloom, 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 toodaloom. Hoppy Hollihan. Good old Bloom. There's nobody like him after all. Paddy Leonard. Stage Irishman. Bloom. What? Railway opera is like a tram line in Gibraltar. The Rose of Castile. Laughter. Lenahan. Plagiarist. Down with Bloom. The veiled Sibyl, enthusiastically. I'm a Bloomite and I glory in it. 
I believe in him in spite of all. I'd give my life for him, the funniest man on earth. Bloom winks at the bystanders. I bet she's a bonny lassie. Theodore Purefoy, in fishing cap and oilskin jacket. He employs a mechanical device to frustrate the sacred ends of nature. The veiled Sibyl stabs herself. My hero god, she dies. Many most attractive and enthusiastic women also commit suicide by stabbing, drowning, drinking prussic acid, aconite, arsenic, opening their veins, refusing food, casting themselves under steam rollers from the top of Nelson's pillar into the great vat of Guinness's brewery, asphyxiating themselves by placing their heads in gas ovens, hanging themselves in stylish garters, leaping from windows of different stories. Alexander J. Dowie, violently. Fellow Christians and anti-bloomites, the man called Bloom is from the roots of hell. A disgrace to Christian men, a fiendish libertine from his earliest years, this stinking goat of Mendes gave precocious signs of infantile debauchery, recalling the cities of the plain with a desolate grandam. This vile hypocrite, bronzed with infamy, is the white bull mentioned in the apocalypse a worshipper of the scarlet woman intrigue is the very breath of his nostrils the steak faggots and the cauldron of boiling oil are for him caliban the mob lynch him roast him he's as bad as parnell was mr fox Mother Grogan throws her boot at Bloom. Several shopkeepers from Upper and Lower Dorset Street throw objects of little or no commercial value, ham bones, condensed milk tins, unsaleable cabbage, stale bread, sheep's tails, odd pieces of fat. Bloom excitedly. This is midsummer madness, some ghastly joke again, by heaven. I am guiltless as the unsunned snow. It was my brother, Henry. He is my double. He lives in number two Dolphin's barn. Slander, the viper, has wrongfully accused me. Fellow countrymen, skenlin ban bata koiste gan kapal. I call on my old friend Dr. Malachi Mulligan, sex specialist, to give medical testimony on my behalf. Dr. Mulligan, in motor jerkin, green motor goggles on his brow. Dr. Bloom is bisexually abnormal. He has recently escaped from Dr. Eustace's private asylum for demented gentlemen. Born out of bedlock, hereditary epilepsy is present, the consequence of unbridled lust. Traces of elephantiasis have been discovered among his ascendants. There are marked symptoms of chronic exhibitionism. Ambidexterity is also latent. He is prematurely bald from self-abuse perversely idealistic in consequence, a reformed rake, and has metal teeth. In consequence of a family complex, he has temporarily lost his memory, and I believe him to be more sinned against than sinning. I have made a pre-vaginal examination, and after application of the acid test to 5,427 anal, axillary, pectoral, and pubic hairs, I declare him to be Virgo intacta. Bloom holds his high-grade hat over his genital organs. Dr. Madden. Hypsus patty is also marked. In the interest of coming generations, I suggest that the parts affected should be preserved in spirits of wine in the National Teratological Museum. Dr. Crothers. I have examined the patient's urine. It is albuminoid. Salivation is insufficient. The patella reflex intermittent. Dr. Punch Costello. The fetor judaicus is most perceptible. Dr. Dixon reads a bill of health. 
Professor Bloom is a finished example of the new womanly man. His moral nature is simple and lovable. Many have found him a dear man, a dear person. He is a rather quaint fellow, on the whole, coy, though not feeble-minded in the medical sense. He has written a really beautiful letter, a poem in itself, to the court missionary of the Reformed Priests' Protection Society, which clears up everything. He is practically a total abstainer, and I can affirm that he sleeps on a straw litter and eats the most Spartan food, cold, dried grocer's peas. He wears a hair shirt of pure Irish manufacture, winter and summer, and scourges himself every Saturday. He was, I understand, at one time a first-class misdemeanant in Glencree Reformatory. Another report states that he was a very posthumous child. I appeal for clemency in the name of the most sacred word our vocal organs have ever been called upon to speak. He is about to have a baby. General commotion and compassion. Women faint. A wealthy American makes a street collection for Bloom. Gold and silver coins, blank checks, banknotes, jewels, treasury bonds, maturing bills of exchange, IOUs, wedding rings, watch chains, lockets, necklaces and bracelets are rapidly collected. Bloom. Oh, I so want to be a mother. Mrs. Thornton, in Nurse Tender's gown. Embrace me tight, dear. You'll be soon over it. Tight, dear. Bloom embraces her tightly and bears eight male, yellow and white, children. They appear on a red carpeted staircase adorned with expensive plants. All the octuplets are handsome, with valuable metallic faces, well made, respectably dressed and well conducted, speaking five modern languages fluently, and interested in various arts and sciences. Each has his name printed in legible letters on his shirt front. Nasodoro, Goldfinger, Chrysostomos, Maindori, Silver Smile, Silber Selber, Vifargent, Panarjaros. They are immediately appointed to positions of high public trust in several different countries as managing directors of banks, traffic managers of railways, chairman of limited liability companies, Vice Chairman of Hotel Syndicates. A voice. Bloom, are you the Messiah Ben Joseph or Ben David? Bloom, darkly. You have said it. Brother Buzz. Then perform a miracle like uh, Father Charles. Bantam Lyons. Prophesy who will win the Saint Leger. Bloom walks on a net, covers his left eye with his left ear, passes through several walls, climbs Nelson's pillar, hangs from the top ledge by his eyelids, eats twelve dozen oysters, shells included, heals several sufferers from king's evil, contracts his face so as to resemble many historical personages, Lord Beaconsfield, Lord Byron, Watt Tyler, Moses of Egypt, Moseph Maimonides, Moseph Mendelssohn, Henry Irving, Rip Van Winkle, Kossuth, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Baron Leopold Rothschild, Robinson Crusoe, Sherlock Holmes, Pasteur, turns each foot simultaneously in different directions, bids the tide turn back, eclipses the sun by extending his little finger. Brini, Papal Nuncio, in papal zouave's uniform, steel cuirasses as breastplate, arm plates, thigh plates, leg plates, large profane moustaches, and brown paper mitre. Leopoldi autem generatio. Moses begat Noah, and Noah begat Eunuch, and Eunuch begat O'Halloran, and O'Halloran begat Guggenheim, and Guggenheim begat Agendath. And again Dath begat Nataim, and Nataim begat Lahersh, and Lahersh begat Jesurum, and Jesurum begat Mackay, and Mackay begat Ostrolopsky, 
and Ostrolopsky begat Smerdols, and Smerdols begat Weiss, and Weiss begat Schwarz, and Schwarz begat Adrianopoli, and Adrianopoli begat Arandres, and Arandres begat Louis Lawson, and Louis Lawson begat Ikabudonosor, and Ikabudonosor begat O'Donnell Magnus, and O'Donnell Magnus begat Christbaum, and Christbaum begat Ben Maimun, and Ben Maimun begat Dusty Rhodes, and Dusty Rhodes begat Ben Amor, and Ben Amor begat Joan Smith, and Joan Smith begat Zavorgnanovich, and Zavorgnanovich begat Jasperstone, and Jasperstone begat Vingtetuniemi, and Vingtetuniemi begat Zombathli, and Zombathli begat Virag, and Virag begat Bloom. Et vocabitur nomen ius Emmanuel. A dead hand writes on the wall. Bloom is a cod. Crab in Bushranger's kit. What did you do in the cattle creek behind Kilbarak? A female infant shakes a rattle. And under Ballybo Bridge. A holly bush. And in the Devil's Glen? Bloom blushes furiously all over from Franz to Nate's, three tears falling from his left eye. Spare my past. The Irish evicted tenants, in body coats, knee breeches, with Donnybrook fair shillelaghs. Zjambok him. Bloom, with ass's ears, seats himself in the pillory with crossed arms, his feet protruding. He whistles Don Giovanni, a senar teco. Artane orphans joining hands caper round him. Girls of the prison gate mission joining hands caper round in the opposite direction. The Artane orphans. You hig, you hog, you dirty dog, you think the ladies love you? The prison gate girls. If you see Kay, tell him he may see you in tea, tell him from me. Hornblower in ephod and hunting cap announces and he shall carry the sins of the people to azazel the spirit which is in the wilderness and to lilith the night hag and they shall stone him and defile him yea all from agendath nataim and from mizraim the land of ham all the people cast soft pantomime stones at bloom Many bona fide travellers and ownerless dogs come near him and defile him. Mastiansky and Citron approach in gabardines wearing long earlocks. They wag their beards at bloom. Mastiansky and Citron. Belial, lame line of Istria, the false messiah. Abulafia, recant. George R. Messias, Bloom's tailor, appears, a tailor's goose under his arm, presenting a bill. Messias. To alteration, one pair trousers, eleven shillings. Bloom rubs his hands cheerfully. Just like old times. Poor Bloom. Reuben J. Dodd, black-bearded Iscariot, bad shepherd, bearing on his shoulders the drowned corpse of his son, approaches the pillory. Reuben J. whispers hoarsely, The squeak is out. A split is gone for the flatties. Nip the first rattler. The fire brigade. Plop! Brother Buzz invests Bloom in a yellow habit with embroidery of painted flames and high-pointed hat. He places a bag of gunpowder round his neck and hands him over to the civil power, saying, Forgive him his trespasses. Lieutenant Myers of the Dublin Fire Brigade, by general request, sets fire to Bloom. Lamentations. The Citizen. Thank heaven. Bloom, in a seamless garment marked I.H.S., stands upright amid phoenix flames. Weep not for me, O daughters of Erin. He exhibits to Dublin reporters traces of burning. 
the daughters of Aaron, in black garments, with large prayer books and long lighted candles in their hands, kneel down and pray. Daughters of Aaron. Kidney of bloom, pray for us. Flower of the bath, pray for us. Mentor of Menton, pray for us. Canvasser for the freeman, pray for us. Charitable mason, pray for us. Wandering soap, pray for us. Sweets of sin, pray for us. Music without words, pray for us. Reprover of the citizen, pray for us. Friends of all frillies, pray for us. Midwife most merciful, pray for us. Potato preservative against plague and pestilence, pray for us. A choir of six hundred voices conducted by Vincent O'Brien sings the chorus from Handel's Messiah, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth, accompanied on the organ by Joseph Glynn. Bloom becomes mute, shrunken, carbonized. Zoe. Talk away till you're black in the face. Bloom. In Cawbean, with clay pipe stuck in the band, dusty brogues, an immigrant's red handkerchief bundle in his hand, leading a black bog-oak pig by Sugon, with a smile in his eye. Let me be going now, woman of the house, for by all the goats in Connemara, I am after having the father and mother of a baiting. With a tear in his eye. All insanity, patriotism, sorrow for the dead, music, future of the race, to be or not to be, Life's dream is o'er. End it peacefully. They can live on. He gazes far away mournfully. I am ruined. A few pastilles of aconite, the blinds drawn, a letter, then lie back to rest. He breathes softly. No more. I have lived. Fair. Farewell. Zoe. Stiffly, her finger in her neck fillet. Honest? Till the next time, she sneers. Suppose you got up the wrong side of the bed, or came too quick with your best girl. Oh, I can read your thoughts. Bloom, bitterly. Man and woman, love, what is it? A cork and bottle. I'm sick of it. Let everything rip. Zoe, in sudden sulks. I hate a rotter that's insincere give a bleeding whore a chance. Bloom, repentantly. I am very disagreeable. You are a necessary evil. Where are you from? London? Zoe, glibly. Hogs Norton, where the pigs play the organs. I'm Yorkshire-born. She holds his hand, which is feeling for her nipple. I say, Tommy Tittlemouse, stop that and begin worse. <laughs> Have you cash for a short time? Ten shillings? Bloom smiles, nods slowly. More, hourly, more. Zoe. And more's mother. She pats him off-handedly with velvet paws. Are you coming into the music room to see our new pianola? Come, and I'll peel off. Bloom, feeling his occiput dubiously with the unparalleled embarrassment of a harassed peddler gauging the symmetry of her peeled pears. Somebody would be dreadfully jealous if she knew the green-eyed monster. Earnestly. You know how difficult it is. I needn't tell you. Zoe, flattered. What the eye can't see, the heart can't grieve for. She pats him. Come. Bloom. Laughing witch, the hand that rocks the cradle. Zoe. Babby. Bloom. In baby linen and police, big-headed with a call of dark hair, fixes big eyes on her fluid slip and counts its bronze buckles with a chubby finger, his moist tongue lolling and lisping. One, two, three, three, two, clone. The buckles. Love me, love me not. Love me. Zoe. Silent means consent. With little parted talons, she captures his hand, her forefinger giving to his palm the past touch of secret monitor, luring him to doom. Hot hands, cold gizzard. He hesitates amid scents, music, temptations. She leads him towards the steps 
drawing him by the odor of her armpits, the vice of her painted eyes, the rustle of her slip in whose sinuous folds lurks the lion reek of all the male brutes that have possessed her. The male brutes, exhaling sulphur of rut and dung and ramping in their loose box, faintly roaring, their drugged heads swaying to and fro. Good! Zoe and Bloom reach the door where two sister whores are seated. They examine him curiously from under their penciled brows and smile to his hasty bow. He trips awkwardly. Zoe, her lucky hand instantly saving him. Whoopsa! Don't fall upstairs. Bloom. The just man falls seven times. He stands aside at the threshold. After you is good manners. Zoe. Ladies first, gentlemen after. She crosses the threshold. He hesitates. She turns and, holding out her hands, draws him over. He hops. On the antlered rack of the hall hang a man's hat and waterproof. Bloom uncovers himself, but, seeing them, frowns, then smiles, preoccupied. A door on the return landing is flung open. A man in purple shirt and gray trousers, brown-socked, passes with an ape's gait, his bald head and goatee beard upheld, hugging a full water-jug jar, his two-tailed black braces dangling at heels. Averting his face quickly, Bloom bends to examine on the hall table the spaniel eyes of a running fox. Then his lifted head sniffing follows Zoe into the music room. A shade of mauve tissue paper dims the light of the chandelier. Round and round a moth flies, colliding, escaping. The floor is covered with an oilcloth mosaic of jade and azure and cinnabar rhomboids. Footmarks are stamped over it in all senses, heel to heel, heel to hollow, toe to toe, feet locked, a morris of shuffling feet without body phantoms all in a scrimmage higgledy-piggledy. The walls are tapestried with paper of yew fronds and clear glades. In the grate is spread a screen of peacock feathers. Lynch squats cross-legged on the hearth of matted hair, his cap back to the front. With a wand he beats time slowly. Kitty Ricketts, a bony, pallid whore in navy costume, doe-skin gloves rolled back from a coral wristlet, a chain purse in her hand, sits perched on the end of the table, swinging her leg and glancing at herself in the gilt mirror over the mantelpiece. A tag of her corslet lace hangs slightly below her jacket. Lynch indicates mockingly the couple at the piano. Kitty coughs behind her hand. She is a bit imbecilic. She signs with the wagging forefinger. Blem, blem. Lynch lifts up her skirt and white petticoat with his wand. She settles them down quickly. Respect yourself. <clears throat> she hiccups, then bends quickly her sailor hat, under which her hair glows red with henna. Oh, excuse. Zoe. More limelight, Charlie. She goes to the chandelier and turns the gas full cock. Kitty peers at the gas jet. What ails it tonight? Lynch, deeply. Enter a ghost and hobgoblins. Zoe. Clap on the back for Zoe. The wand in Lynch's hand flashes a brass poker. Stephen stands at the pianola on which sprawl his hat and ash plant. With two fingers he repeats once more the series of empty fifths. Flory Talbot, a blonde, feeble, goose-fat whore, in a tatterdemalion gown of mildewed strawberry, lolls spread eagle on the sofa corner, her limp forearm pendant over the bolster, listening. A heavy sty droops over her sleepy eyelid. Kitty hiccups again with a kick of her horsed foot. Oh, excuse. Zoe promptly. Your boy's thinking of you. Tie a knot on your shift. Kitty Ricketts bends her head. Her boa uncoils, slides, glides over her shoulder, back, arm, chair, to the ground. Lynch lifts the curled caterpillar on his wand. She snakes her neck, nestling. Stephen glances behind at the squatted figure with its cap back to the front. Stephen. As a matter of fact, it is of no importance whether Benedetto Marcello found it or made it. The right is the poet's rest. 
It may be an old hymn to Demeter, or also illustrate Coella and Arant Glorium Domini. It is susceptible of nodes, or modes, as far apart as Hyperphrygian and Mixolydian, and of texts so divergent as priests high hooping round David's, that is, Circe's, or what am I saying, Circe's altar, and David's tip from the stable to his chief bassoonist about the all-rightness of his almightiness. Manon de non, that is another pair of trousers. Je la gomme, faut que je ne sais pas. He stops, points at Lynch's cap, smiles, laughs. <laughs> Which side is your knowledge bump? The cap with saturnine spleen. Bah! It is because it is. Woman's reason. Jew Greek is Greek Jew. Extremes meet. Death is the highest form of life. Bah! Stephen. You remember fairly accurately all my errors, boasts, mistakes. <laughs> How long shall I continue to close my eyes to disloyalty? Whetstone. The cap. Bah. Stephen. Here's another for you. He frowns. The reason is because the fundamental and the dominant are separated by the greatest possible interval, which... The cap. Which... Finish. You can't. Stephen, with an effort. Interval which... Is the greatest possible ellipse consistent with... The ultimate return. The octave. Which... The cap. Which? Outside the gramophone begins to blare, The Holy City. Stephen, abruptly. What went forth to the ends of the world to transverse not itself, God, the Son, Shakespeare, a commercial traveler having itself uh, traversed in reality itself, becomes that self. Wait a moment, wait a second. Damn, that fellow's noise in the street. <sighs> self which itself was ineluctably preconditioned to become. Echo! Lynch, with a mocking whinny of laughter, grins at Bloom and Zoe Higgins. What a learned speech, eh? Zoe, briskly. God help your head, he knows more than you have forgotten. With obese stupidity, Flory Talbot regards Stephen. Flory. They say the last day is coming this summer. Kitty. No. Zoe explodes in laughter. Great unjust God! Flory offended. Well, it was in the papers about Antichrist. Oh, my foot's tickling. Ragged barefoot newsboys, jogging a wagtail kite, patter past, yelling. The newsboys. Stop press edition! Result from the rocking horse races! Sea serpent in the royal canal! Safe arrival of Antichrist! Stephen turns and sees Bloom. Stephen. A time, times, and half a time. Reuben I. Antichrist, wandering Jew, a clutching hand open on his spine, stumps forward. Across his loins is slung a pilgrim's wallet from which protrude promissory notes and dishonored bills. Aloft over his shoulder he bears a long boat pole from the hook of which the sodden, huddled mass of his only son, saved from liffy waters, hangs from the slack of its breeches. A hobgoblin in the image of Punch Costello, hip-shot, crook-backed, hydrocephalic, prognathic with receding forehead, and alley sloper nose tumbles in somersaults through the gathering darkness. All. What? The hobgoblin, his jaws chattering, capers to and fro, goggling his eyes, squeaking, kangaroo hopping with outstretched clutching arms, then all at once thrusts his lipless face through the fork of his thighs. Il vient, c'est moi, l'homme qui rit, l'homme primogène. He whirls round and round with dervish howls. Sieurs et dames, faites vos jeux. He crouches, juggling. Tiny roulette planets fly from his hands. Les jeux sont faits. 
The planets rushed together, uttering crepitant cracks. Rien va plus. The planets, buoyant balloons, sail swollen up and away. He springs off into vacuum. Flory, sinking into torpor, crossing herself secretly. The end of the world. A female tepid effluvium leaks out from her. Nebulous obscurity occupies space. Through the drifting fog without, the gramophone blares over coughs and feet shuffling. The gramophone. Jerusalem, open your gates and sing. Hosanna. A rocket rushes up the sky and bursts. A white star falls from it, proclaiming the consummation of all things and second coming of Elijah. Along an infinite, invisible tightrope, taut from zenith to nadir, the end of the world, a two-headed octopus in gillies kilts, busby and tartan filibegs, whirls through the murk, head over heels, in the form of the three legs of man. The end of the world, with a Scotch accent, He'll dance the keel row, the keel row, the keel row. Over the passing drift and choking breath coughs, Elijah's voice, harsh as a corn cake's, jars on high. Perspiring in a loose lawn surplice, with funnel sleeves, he is seen, verger faced, above a rostrum about which the banner of old glory is draped. He thumps the parapet. End of Ulysses 15C Read by Anita Roy Dobbs in Boston, June 2007《Ulysses 15, D, the fourth of seven parts. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ulysses by James Joyce, 15, D. Elijah. No yapping, if you please, in this booth. Jake Crane, Crail Sue, Dove Campbell, Abe Kirshner. Do your coughing with your mouths shut. Say, I am operating all this trunk line. Boys, do it now. God's time is 12.25. Tell your mother you'll be there. Rush your order and you play a slick ace. Join on right here. Book through to eternity junction, the non-stop run. Just one word more. Are you a god or a doggone clod? If the second advent came to Coney Island, are you ready? Flory Christ, Stephen Christ, Zoe Christ, Bloom Christ, Kitty Christ, Lynch Christ, it's up to you to sense that cosmic force. Have we cold feet about the cosmos? No. Be on the side of the angels. Be a prism. You have that something within, the higher self. You can rub shoulders with a Jesus, a Gautama, an Ingersoll. Are you all in this vibration? I say you are! You once nobble that congregation and a buck joy ride to heaven becomes a back number. You got me? It's a life brightener, sure. The hottest stuff ever was. It's the whole pie with jam in. It's just the cutest, snappiest line out. It is immense! Super sumptuous. It restores. It vibrates. I know... And I am some vibrator, joking part aside, and getting down to bedrock. A. J. Christ Dowie and the Harmonial Philosophy. Have you got that? O. K. 77 West 69th Street. Got me? That's it. You call me up by sun phone any old time. Bumboozers, save your stamps. He shouts. Now then, our glory song. All join in heartily in the singing. Encore. He sings. Jaru. The gramophone drowning his voice. Jerusalem, you rival. The disc rasps gratingly against the needle. The three whores, covering their ears, squawk. 
Elijah, in rolled-up shirt-sleeves, black in the face, shouts at the top of his voice, his arms uplifted. Big brother up there! Mr. President, you hear what I done just been saying to you? Certainly I sort of believe strong in you, Mr. President. I certainly am thinking now Miss Higgins and Miss Ricketts got religion way inside them. Certainly seems to me I don't never see no wusser scared female than the way you been, Miss Flory. Just now, as I done seed you, Mr. President, you come long and help me save our sisters, dear. He winks at his audience. Our oh, Mr. President, he twigged the whole lot and he ain't saying nothing. Kitty Kate. I forgot myself. In a weak moment, I erred and did what I did on Constitution Hill. I was confirmed by the bishop and enrolled in the brown scapular. My mother's sister married a Montmorency. It was a working plumber was my ruination when I was pure. Zofanny. I let him lop it into me for the fun of it. Flory Teresa. It was in consequence of a port wine beverage on top of Hennessy's three star. <laughs> I was guilty with Whalen when he slipped into the bed. Stephen. In the beginning was the word, in the end the world without end. Blessed be the eight Beatitudes. The Beatitudes, Dixon, Madden, Crothers, Costello, Lenahan, Bannon, Mulligan, and Lynch, in white surgical students' gowns, four abreast, goose stepping, tramp, fist passed in noisy marching. The Beatitudes, incoherently. Beer, beef, battle dog, Bible, Bissinum, Barnum, Buggerum, Bishop. Leicester, in Quaker gray, knee breeches, and broad brimmed hat, says discreetly, Hmm, he is our friend. I need not mention names. Seek thou the light. He corantos by. Best enters in hairdresser's attire, shinily laundered his locks in curl-papers. He leads John Eglinton, who wears a mandarin's kimono of nankeen yellow, lizard-lettered, and a high pagoda hat. Best, smiling, lifts the hat and displays a shaven pole from the crown of which bristles a pigtail toupee tied with an orange topknot. I was just beautifying him, don't you know? A thing of beauty, don't you know? Yates says, or I mean... Keats says, John Eglinton produces a green-capped dark lantern and flashes it toward a corner with carping accent. Aesthetics and cosmetics are for the boudoir. I am out for truth, plain truth for a plain man. Tanderagi wants the facts and means to get them. In the cone of the searchlight behind the coal scuttle, olive, holy-eyed, the bearded figure of Mananoan Mackler broods, chin on knees. He rises slowly. A cold sea wind blows from his druid mouth. About his head writhe eels and elvers. He is encrusted with weeds and shells. His right hand holds a bicycle pump. His left hand grasps a huge crayfish by its two talons. Mananoan Mackler, with a voice of waves. Oh. Heck, wallach, more ma, white yogan of the gods, a cult pymander of Hermes Trismegistos, with a voice of whistling sea wind. Punarjanam patsi punjaub. I won't have my leg pulled. It has been said by one, beware the left, the cult of Shakti. With a cry of storm birds, Shakti Shiva, dark hidden father, he smites with his bicycle pump the crayfish in his left hand. On its cooperative dial glow the twelve signs of the zodiac. He wails with the vehemence of the ocean. Aum, baum, pajam. I am the father of the homestead. I am the dreamery, creamery butter. A skeleton, Juddashand, strangles the light. The green light wanes to mauve. The gas jet, whales whistling. The gas jet. <laughs> Zoe runs to the chandelier and, crooking her leg, adjusts the mantle. Zoe. Who has a fag as I'm here? Lynch, tossing a cigarette onto the table. Here. 
Zoe, her head perched aside in mock pride. Is that the way to hand the pot to a lady? She stretches up to light the cigarette over the flame, twirling it slowly, showing the brown tufts of her armpits. Lynch, with his poker, lifts boldly a side of her slip. Bare from her garters up, her flesh appears under the sapphire, a nixie's green. She puffs calmly at her cigarette. Can you see the beauty spot of my behind? Lynch. I'm not looking. Zoe makes sheep's eyes. No. You wouldn't do a less thing. Would you suck a lemon? Squinting in mock shame, she glances with sidelong meaning at Bloom, then twists round towards him, pulling her slip free of the poker. Blue fluid again flows over her flesh. Bloom stands, smiling desirously, twirling his thumbs. Kitty Ricketts licks her middle finger with her spittle and, gazing in the mirror, smooths both eyebrows. Lipoti Virag, Basilicogrammati, shoots rapidly down through the chimney flue and struts two steps to the left on gawky pink stilts. He is sausaged into several overcoats and wears a brown mackintosh under which he holds a roll of parchment. In his left eye flashes the monocle of Cashel Boyle O'Connor, Fitzmaurice Tisdale Ferrell. On his head is perched an Egyptian pshint. Two quills project over his ears. Virag. Heels together, bows. My name is Virag Lipoti of Zombafeli. He coughs thoughtfully, dryly. <coughs> Promiscuous nakedness is much in evidence hereabouts, eh? Inadvertently, her back view revealed the fact that she is not wearing those rather intimate garments of which you are a particular devotee. The injection mark on the thigh I hope you perceived. Good. Bloom. Gran Papachi, but... Virag. Number two, on the other hand, she of the cherry rouge and coiffuse white, whose hair owes not a little to our tribal elixir of gopher wood, is in walking costume and tightly stayed by her sit, I should opine. Backbone in front, so to say. Correct me, but I always understood the act so performed by skittish humans with glimpses of lingerie appealed to you in virtue of its exhibitionist disticity. In a word, hippogriff. Am I right? Bloom. She is rather lean. Virag, not unpleasantly. Absolutely well observed in those pannier pockets of the skirt and slightly peg-top effect are devised to suggest bunchiness of hip, a new purchase at some monster sale for which a gull has been mulcted. Meretricious finery to deceive the eye. Observe the attention to details of dust specks. Never put on you tomorrow what you can wear today. Parallax. With a nervous twitch of his head. Did you hear my brain go snap? Polysyllabax. Bloom, an elbow resting in a hand, a forefinger against his cheek. She seems sad. Virag, cynically, his weasel teeth bared yellow, draws down his left eye with a finger and barks hoarsely. Hoax! Beware of a flapper and bogus mournful. Lily of the alley. All possess bachelor's button. Discovered by Raldus Columbus. Tumble her. Columble her. Chameleon. More genially. Well, then, permit me to draw your attention to item number three. There is plenty of her visible to the naked eye. Observe the mass of oxygenated vegetable matter on her skull. What ho! She bumps. The ugly duckling of the party, long casted and deep in keel. Bloom regretfully. When you come out without your gun. Virag. We can do you all brands, mild, medium, and strong. Pay your money, take your choice. How happy could you be with either? Bloom. With? Virag, his tongue up curling. Liam, look! Her beam is broad. She is coated with quite a considerable layer of fat. Obviously, mammal, in weight of bosom, you remark that she has in front well to the fore two protuberances of very respectable dimensions, inclined to fall in the noonday soup-plate. 
effect, while on her rear lower down are two additional protuberances suggestive of potent rectum and tumescent for palpation, which leave nothing to be desired save compactness. Such fleshy parts are the product of careful nurture. When coop fattened, their livers reach an elephantine size. Pellets of new bread with fenugreek and gum benjamin swamped down by potions of green tea endow them during their brief existence with natural pincushions of quite colossal blubber. What suits your book, eh? Flesh hot pots of Egypt to hanker after, wallow in it. Like podium. His throat twitches. Slap bang, there he goes again. Bloom. The sty I dislike. Virag arches his eyebrows. Contact with a gold ring, they say. Argumentum ad feminam, as we said in old Rome and ancient Greece, in the consulship of Diplodocus and Ichthyosaurus. For the rest, Eve's sovereign remedy, not for sale, hire only, Huguenot. He twitches. It is a funny sound. He coughs encouragingly. <laughs> but possibly it is only a wart. I presume you have remembered what I will have taught you on that head. Wheaten meal with honey and nutmeg. Bloom reflecting. Wheaten meal with lycopodium and syllabax. This searching ordeal, it has been an unusually fatiguing day, a chapter of accidents. Wait, I mean, warts blood spreads warts. You said... Virag severely, his nose hard-humped, his side-eye winking. Stop twirling your thumbs and give a good old thunk. See, you have forgotten. Exercise your pneumotechnic. La causa e santa. Tara, tara. Aside. He will surely remember. Bloom. Rosemary also, did I understand you to say, or willpower over parasitic tissues? Then nay, no, I have an inkling. The touch of a dead hand cures. Nemo? Virag excitedly. I say so, I say so, e'en so, technic. He taps his parchment roll energetically. This book tells you how to act with all descriptive particulars. Consult index for agitated fear of aconite. Melancholy of muriatic. Priapic pulsatia. Virag is going to talk about amputation. Our old friend, Caustic. They must be starved. Snip off the horse hair under the denned neck. But to change the venue of the bulgar and the basque, have you made up your mind whether you like or dislike women in male habiliments? With a dry snigger. You intended to devote an entire year to the study of the religious problem in the summer months of 1886 to square the circle and win that million. Pomegranate! From the sublime to the ridiculous is but a step. Pajamas, let us say? Or stocking get, gusseted knickers, closed? Or put we the case, those complicated combinations, kamenickers? He crows derisively. Kee, kee, ri, kee. Bloom surveys uncertainly the three whores, then gazes at the veiled mauve light, hearing the ever-flying moth. Bloom. I wanted then to have now concluded... Nightdress was never, hence this, but tomorrow is a new day will be. Past was is today. What now is will then morrow, as now was be past yester. Virag prompts in a pig's whisper. Insects of the day spend their brief existence in reiterated coition, lured by the smell of the inferiorly pulchritudinous female possessing extendified pudental nerve in dorsal region. Pretty Paul. His yellow parrot beak gabbles nasally. They had a proverb in the Carpathians in or about the year 5550 of our era. One tablespoon of honey will attract, friend Bruin, more than half a dozen barrels of first choice malt vinegar. Bears buzz bothers bees. But of this apart, at another time we may resume. We are very pleased, we others. He coughs and, bending his brow, rubs his nose thoughtfully with a scooping hand. You shall find that these night insects follow the light, an illusion for remember their complex unadjustable eye. For all these naughty points, see the seventeenth book of my Fundamentals of Sexology, or the love passion which Dr. L. B. says is the book sensation of the year. 
Some, to example, there are again whose movements are automatic. Perceive. That is his appropriate son. Night bird, night sun, night town. Chase me, Charlie. He blows into Bloom's ear. Buzz. Bloom. Be your blue bottle to other day butting shadow on wall dazed self then we wander dazed down shirt good job i virag his face impassive laughs in a rich feminine key splendid spanish fly in his fly or mustard plaster on his dibble he gobbles gluttonously with turkey wattles bubbly jock bubbly jock where are we open sesame come forth he unrolls his parchment rapidly and reads, his glow-worm's nose running backwards over the letters which he claws. Stay, good friend, I bring thee thy answer. Red Bank oysters will shortly be upon us. I'm the best a cook. Those succulent bivalves may help us, and the truffles of Perigord, tubers dislodged through Mr. Omnivorous Porker, were usurped in cases of nervous debility or viragitis. Though they stink, yet they sting. He wags his head with cackling raillery. Jocular! With my eyeglass in my ocular! He sneezes. Amen! Bloom absently. Ocularly woman's bivalve case is worse. Always open sesame, the cloven sex. Why they fear vermin, creeping things, yet Eve and the serpent contradicts. Not a historical fact. Obvious analogy to my idea. Serpents, too, are gluttons for women's milk. Wind their way through miles of omnivorous forest to suck succulent her breast dry. Like those bubbly jocular Roman matrons one reads of in Elephantiliasis. Virag, his mouth projected in hard wrinkles, eyes stonily, forlornly closed, psalms in outlandish monotone. That the cows with their those distended udders, that they have been thee, thee known. Flume. I'm going to scream. I beg your pardon. Ah, so. He repeats. Spontaneously to seek out the Saurian's lair in order to entrust their teats to his avid suction. Ant milks aphis. Profoundly. Instinct rules the world in life, in death. Virag, head askew, arches his back and hunched wing shoulders, peers at the moth out of blear bulged eyes, points a horning claw and cries, Who's moth, moth? Who's dear Gerald? Dear Ger- That you? Oh dear, he is Gerald. Oh, I much fear he shall be most badly burned. Will some pleasy Persian not now impediment so catastrophics mit agitation of first-class table numpkin? He mews. Puss, 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 puss. He sighs, draws back and stares sideways down with dropping underjaw. Well, well, he doth rest anon. He snaps his jaws suddenly on the air. The moth. I'm a tiny, tiny thing, ever flying in the spring, round and round a ring a ring. Long ago I was a king, now I do this kind of thing, on the wing, on the wing. Bing! He rushes against the mauve shade, flapping noisily. Pretty, 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 pretty petticoats. From left upper entrance, with two gliding steps, Henry Flower comes forward to left, front, center. He wears a dark mantle and drooping plumed sombrero. He carries a silver-stringed inlaid dulcimer and long-stemmed bamboo Jacob's pipe, its clay bowl fashioned as a female head. He wears dark velvet hose and silver-buckled pumps. He has the romantic saviour's face with flowing locks, thin beard and moustache. His spindle legs and sparrow feet are those of the tenor Mario, prince of Candia. He settles down his gophered ruffs and moistens his lips with the passage of his amorous tongue. Henry, in a low, dulcet voice, touching the strings of his guitar. There is a flower that bloometh. Virag, truculent, his jowl set, stares at the lamp. Grave bloom regards Zoe's neck. Henry Gallant turns with pendant dewlap to the piano. Stephen, to himself, 
Play with your eyes shut. Imitate pa. Filling my belly with husks of swine. Too much of this. I will arise and go to my... Expect this is the... Steve, thou art in a parlous way. Must visit old Deasy or telegraph. Our interview of this morning has left on me a deep impression, though our ages will write fully tomorrow. <laughs> I'm, I'm partially drunk, by the way. He touches the keys again. Minor chord comes now, yes. Not much, however. Almadano Artifoni holds out a baton roll of music with vigorous moustache work. Artifoni. Si, rifletta, le al rovino tutto. Flory. Sing us something. Love's old sweet song. Stephen. No voice. I am a most finished artist. Lynch, did I show you the letter about the lute? Flory, smirking. The bird that can sing and won't sing. The Siamese twins, Philip drunk and Philip sober, two Oxford dons with lawnmowers, appear in the window embrasure. Both are masked with Matthew Arnold's face. Philip sober. Take a fool's advice. All is not well. Work it out with the butt end of a pencil like a good young idiot. Three pounds twelve you got. Two notes, one sovereign, two crowns, if youth but knew. Moonies and Ville. Moonies sur mer. The Moira. Larche, Holes Street Hospital, Berks, eh? I am watching you. Philip drunk impatiently. Ah, bosh, man, go to hell. I paid my way. If I could only find out about octaves. Reduplication of personality. Who was it told me his name? His lawnmower begins to purr. Ah, yes. Oh, y moi, ça, ça, gapo. Have a notion I was here before. When was it not Atkinson's his card I have somewhere? Mac somebody. Unmac I have it. I uh, told me about hold on, Swineburn, was it? No. Flory. And the song Stephen. Spirit is welling, but the flesh is weak. Flory. Are you out of Maynooth? You're like someone I knew once. Stephen. Out of it now. To himself. Clever. Philip drunk and Philip sober, their lawnmowers purring with a rigadoon of grass homes. Clever ever. Out of it, out of it. By the by, have you the book, The Thing, the Ash Plant? Yes, there it is, yes. Clever ever. Out to fit now. Keep in condition. Do like us. Zoe. There was a priest down here two nights ago to do his bit of business with his coat buttoned up. You needn't try to hide, I says to him. I know you've a Roman collar. Virag. Perfectly logical from his standpoint. Fall of man. Harshly, his pupils waxing. To hell with the Pope. Nothing new under the sun. I am the Virag who disclosed the sex secrets of monks and maidens. Why I left the Church of Rome. Read the priest, the woman, and the confessional. Penrose, flipperty, jippert. He wriggles. Woman undoing with sweet perdor her belt of rush rope. Offers her all moist yoni to man's lingam. Short time after man presents woman with pieces of jungle meat. Woman shows joy and covers herself with feather skins. Man loves her yoni fiercely with big lingam, the stiff one. He cries, Coactus volui. Then giddy woman will run about. Strong man grasps woman's wrist. Woman squeals, bites, spucks. Man now, fierce angry, strikes woman's fat yadgana. He chases his tail. Piff, paff, popo. He stops, sneezes. Pchip. He worries his butt. Pff. Lynch. I hope you gave the good father a penance. Nine glorias for shooting a bishop. Zoe spouts walrus smoke through her nostrils. He couldn't get a connection. Only, you know, sensation, a dry rush. Bloom. Poor man. Zoe, lightly. Only for what happened to him. Bloom. How? Virag, a diabolical rictus of black luminosity contracting his visage, cranes his scraggy neck forward. He lifts a moon-calf nozzle and howls. Verfluchte Goim! He had a father, forty fathers. 
He never existed. Pig God, he had two left feet. He was Judas Iachia, a Libyan eunuch, the Pope's bastard. He leans out on tortured forepaws, elbows bent rigid, his eyes agonizing in his flat skull neck, and yelps over the mute world. A son of a whore! Apocalypse! Kitty. And Mary Shorthall that was in the lock with the pox she got from Jimmy Pigeon in the blue caps had a child off him that couldn't swallow and was smothered with the convulsions in the mattress we all subscribed for the funeral. Philip drunk gravely. Qui vous a mis dans cette fichue position, Philippe? Philip sober gaily. C'était le sacre pigeon, Philippe. Kitty unpins her hat and sets it down calmly, patting her henna hair. And a prettier, a daintier head of winsome curls was never seen on a whore's shoulders. Lynch puts on her hat. She whips it off. Lynch laughs. And to such delights has Mitchnikoff inoculated anthropoid apes. Flory nods. Locomotor a taxi. Zoe gaily. Oh, my dictionary. Lynch. Three wise virgins. Virag, ague-shaken, profuse yellow spawn foaming over his bony epileptic lips. She sold love filters, white wax, orange flower. Panther, the Roman centurion, polluted her with his genitories. He sticks out a flickering phosphorescent scorpion tongue, his hand on his fork. Messiah, he burst her tympanum. With gibbering baboon's cries, he jerks his hips in the cynical spasm. Hick, heck, hock, hock, hook, cock, cook. Ben Jumbo Dollard, rubicund, muscle-bound, hairy-nostrilled, huge-bearded, cabbage-eared, shaggy-chested, shock-maned, fat, papped, stands forth. His loins and genitals tightened into a pair of black bathing bag slops. Ben Dollard. Knackering castanet bones in his huge padded paws yodels jovially in bass barrel tone. When love absorbs my ardent soul. The virgins Nurse Callahan and Nurse Quigley burst through the ring keepers and the ropes and mob him with open arms. The virgins gushingly. Big Ben, Ben, my tree. A voice. Hold that fellow with the bad breeches. Ben Dollard smites his thigh in abundant laughter. Hold him now! Henry, caressing on his breast a severed female head, murmurs. Thine heart, my love. He plucks his lute strings. When first I saw... Virag sloughing his skins, his multitudinous plumage malting. Rats! He yawns, showing a coal-black throat and closes his jaws by an upward push of his parchment roll. After having said which I took my departure, farewell, fare thee, well, drack! Henry Flower combs his mustache and beard rapidly with a pocket comb and gives a cow's lick to his hair. Steered by his rapier, he glides to the door, his wild harp slung behind him. Virag reaches the door in two ungainly stilt hops, his tail cocked, and deftly claps sideways on the wall a puce yellow flybill, butting it with his head. The flybill. K. I. I. Post no bills. Strictly confidential. Dr. High Franks. Henry. All is lost now. Virag unscrews his head in a trice and holds it under his arm. Virag's head. Quack! Exuant severally. Stephen over his shoulder to Zoe. You would have preferred the fighting parson who founded the Protestant error, but beware Antisthenes the dog sage, and the last of Arius Hersiarchus, the agony in the closet. Lynch. All one and the same God to her. Stephen devoutly. And sovereign Lord of all things. Flory to Stephen. I'm sure you're a spoiled priest, or a monk. Lynch. He is a cardinal's son. Stephen. Cardinal sin, monks of the screw. His eminence, Simon Stephen Cardinal Dedalus, 
primate of all Ireland, appears in the doorway dressed in red soutane, sandals and socks. Seven dwarf simian accolades, also in red, cardinal sins, uphold his train, peeping under it. He wears a battered silk hat sideways on his head. His thumbs are stuck in his armpits and his palms outspread. Round his neck hangs a rosary of corks ending on his breast in a corkscrew cross. Releasing his thumbs, he invokes grace from on high with large wave gestures and proclaims with bloated pomp. The Cardinal. Conservio lies captured. He lies in the lowest dungeon with manacles and chains round his limbs, weighing upward of three tons. He looks at all for a moment, his right eye closed, tight, his left cheek puffed out, then, unable to repress his merriment, he rocks to and fro, arms akimbo, and sings, with broad, rollicking humor, Oh, the poor little fellow! <laughs> his legs, they were yellow! He was plump, fat, and heavy, and brisk as a steak, but some bloody savage, to graze his white cabbage, he murdered Nell Flaherty's duck-loving Drake. A multitude of midges swarms white over his robe. He scratches himself with crossed arms at his ribs, grimacing, and exclaims, I'm suffering the agony of the damned. By the hokey fiddle, thanks be to Jesus, those funny little chaps are not unanimous. If they were, they'd walk me off the face of the bloody globe. His head aslant, he blesses curtly with four and middle fingers, imparts the Easter kiss, and double shuffles off comically, swaying his hat from side to side, shrinking quickly to the size of his train-bearers. The dwarf acolytes, giggling, peeping, nudging, ogling, Easter kissing, zigzag behind him. His voice is heard mellow from afar, merciful male, melodious. Shall carry my heart to thee, shall carry my heart to thee. And the breath of the balmy night shall carry my heart to thee. The trick door handle turns. The door handle. Fee. Zoe. The devil is in that door. A male form passes down the creaking staircase and is heard taking the waterproof and hat from the rack. Bloom starts forward involuntarily and, half-closing the door as he passes, takes the chocolate from his pocket and offers it nervously to Zoe. Zoe sniffs his hair briskly. Hmm, thank your mother for the rabbits. I'm very fond of what I like. Bloom, hearing a male voice in talk with the whores on the doorstep, pricks his ears. If it were he, after, or because not, or the double event... Zoe tears open the silver foil. Fingers was made before forks. She breaks off and nibbles a piece, gives a piece to Kitty Ricketts, and then turns kittenishly to Lynch. No objection to French lozenges? He nods. She taunts him. Have it now, or wait till you get it. He opens his mouth, his head cocked. She whirls the prize in left circle. His head follows. She whirls it back in right circle. He eyes her. Catch! She tosses a piece. With an adroit snap, he catches it and bites it through with a crack. Kitty, chewing. The engineer I was with at the bazaar does have lovely ones, full of the best liquors. And the viceroy was there with his lady, the gas we had on the Toft's hobby horses. <laughs> I'm giddy still. Bloom, in Svengali's fur overcoat with folded arms and Napoleonic forelock, frowns in ventriloquial exorcism with piercing eagle glance towards the door. Then, rigid with left foot advanced, he makes a swift pass with impelling fingers and gives the sign of past master, drawing his right arm downwards from his left shoulder. Go, 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 I conjure you, whoever you are. A male cough and tread are heard passing through the mist outside. Bloom's features relax. He places a hand in his waistcoat, posing calmly. Zoe offers him chocolate. Bloom, solemnly. Thanks. Zoe. Do as you're bid, here. A firm heel-clacking tread is heard on the stairs. Bloom takes the chocolate. Aphrodisiac? Tansy and Pennyroyal? But I bought it. Vanilla combs or... Nemo. 
confused light confuses memory red influences lupus colors affect women's characters any they have this black makes me sad eat and be merry for tomorrow he eats influence taste too mauve but it is so long since i seems new afro that priest must come better late than never try truffles at andrews the door opens bella cohen a massive whore-mistress enters she is dressed in a three-quarter ivory gown fringed round the hem with tasseled selvage and cools herself flirting a black horn fan like minnie hauk in carmen on her left hand are wedding and keeper rings her eyes are deeply carboned she has a sprouting moustache her olive face is heavy slightly sweated and full-nosed with orange-tainted nostrils she has large pendant beryl eardrops bella my word i'm all of a muck sweat she glances round her at the couples then her eyes rest on bloom with hard insistence her large fan winnows wind toward her heated face neck and embon point her falcon eyes glitter the fan flirting quickly then slowly married i see bloom yes partly i have mislaid the fan half opening then closing and the mistress is master petticoat government bloom looks down with a sheepish grin that is so the fan folding together rests against her left eardrop have you forgotten me bloom yes yo the fan folded akimbo against her waist is me her was you dreamed before was then she him you a since knew am all them and the same now we bella approaches gently tapping with the fan bloom wincing powerful being in my eyes read that slumber which women love the fan tapping we have met you are mine it is fate bloom cowed exuberant female enormously i desiderate your domination i am exhausted abandoned no more young i stand so to speak with an unposted letter bearing the extra regulation fee before the too late box of the general post office of human life the door and window open at right angle cause a draft of thirty-two feet per second according to the law of falling bodies i have felt this instant a twinge of sciatica in my left gluteal muscle it runs in our family poor dear papa a widower was a regular barometer from it he believed in animal heat a kind of tabby lined his winter waistcoat near the end remembering king david and the sunumite he shared his bed with athos faithful after death a dog spittle as you probably he winces ah end of ulysses fifteen d Recorded by Anita Roy Dobbs, San Francisco, June 2006. Ulysses, 15E, the fifth of seven parts. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ulysses by James Joyce Chapter 15, Part E Richie Golding, bag-weighted, passes the door. Mocking his catch. Best value in dub. Fit for a prince's. Liver and kidney. The fan, tapping. All things end. Be mine, now. Bloom, undecided. All now? I should not have parted with my talisman. 
rain, exposure at dewfall on the sea rocks, a peccadillo at my time of life. Every phenomenon has a natural cause. The fan points downward slowly. You may. Bloom looks downwards and precedes her unfastened bootlace. We are observed. The fan points downwards quickly. You must. Bloom, with desire, with reluctance. I can make a true black knot. Learned when I served my time and worked the mail order line for Kellett's experienced hand. Every knot says a lot. Let me, in courtesy. I knelt once before today. Ah! Bella raises her gown slightly, and steadying her pose, lifts to the edge of a chair a plump buskined hoof and a full pasterned, silk-socked. Bloom, stiff-legged, aging, bends over her hoof, and with gentle fingers draws out and in her laces. Bloom murmurs lovingly, To be a shoe-fitter in Manfields was my love's young dream, the darling joys of sweet button-hooking, to lace up crisscrossed to knee-length, the dressy kid footwear satin-lined, so incredibly impossibly small, of Clyde Road ladies. Even their wax model Raymond I visited daily, to admire her cobweb hose and stick of rhubarb toe, as worn in Paris. The hoof. Smell my hot goat hide. Feel my royal weight. Bloom. Cross-lacing. Too tight? The hoof. If you bungle, Handy Andy, I'll kick your football for you. Bloom. Not to lace the wrong eyelet as I did the night of the bazaar dance. Bad luck. Hook and wrong tash of her. The person you mentioned. That night she met. No. He knots the lace. Bella places her foot on the floor. Bloom raises his head. Her heavy face, her eyes, strike him in mid-brow. His eyes grow dull, darker, and pouched. His nose thickens. Bloom mumbles. Awaiting your further orders, we remain, gentlemen. Bello, with a hard basilisk stare in a baritone voice. Hound of dishonor. Bloom, infatuated. Empress. Bello, his heavy cheek chops sagging. Adorer of the adulterous rump. Bloom, plaintively. Hugeness. Bellow, dung devourer. Bloom, with sinews semi-flexed. Mag magnificence. Bellow, down. He taps her on the shoulder with his fan. Incline feet forward. Slide left foot one pace back. You will fall. You are falling. On the hands, down. Bloom, her eyes upturned. In the sign of admiration, closing, yaps, truffles. <laughs> With a piercing epileptic cry, she sinks on all fours, grunting, snuffling, rooting at his feet, then lies, shamming dead. With eyes shut tight, trembling eyelids, bowed upon the ground in the attitude of most excellent master. Bello. With bobbed hair, purple gills, fat moustache rings round his shaven mouth, in mountaineer's puttees, green silver-buttoned coat, sport skirt and alpine hat with moorcock's feather, his hands stuck deep in his breeches' pockets, places his heel on her neck and grinds it in. Feel my entire weight. Bow, bond slave, before the throne of your despot's glorious heels, so glistening in their proud erectness. Bloom, enthralled. Bleats. I promise never to disobey. Bello laughs loudly. Holy smoke, you little know what's in store for you. I am the tartar to settle your little lot and break you in. I'll bet Kentucky cocktails all round I shame it out of you, old son. Cheek me, I dare you, if you do tremble in anticipation of heel discipline to be inflicted in gym costume. Bloom creeps under the sofa and peers out through the fringe. Zoe. Widening her slip to screen her. She's not here. Bloom, closing her eyes. She's not here. Flory, hiding her with her gown. She didn't mean it, Mr. Bello. She'll be good, sir. Kitty, don't be too hard on her, Mr. Bello. Sure you won't, ma'am, sir. Bello, coaxingly. Come, ducky dear. I want a word with you, darling, just to administer correction. Just a little heart-to-heart -heart talk, sweetie. Bloom puts out her timid head. 
there's a good girlie now. Bella grabs her hair violently and drags her forward. I only want to correct you for your own good on a soft, safe spot. How's that tender behind? Oh, ever so gently, pet. Begin to get ready. Bloom, fainting. Don't tear my... Bello, savagely. The nose ring, the pliers, the bastinado, the hanging hook, the knout I'll make you kiss while the flutes play like the Nubian slave of old. You're in for it this time. I'll make you remember me for the balance of your natural life. His forehead veins swollen, his face congested. I shall sit on your ottoman saddleback every morning after my thumping good breakfast of Matterson's fat ham rashers and a bottle of Guinness's porter. He belches, and suck my thumping good stock exchange cigarette while I read the licensed victualler's gazette. Very possibly I shall have you slaughtered and skewered in my stables, and enjoy a slice of you with crisp crackling from the baking tin basted and baked like sucking pig with rice and lemon or currant sauce. It will hurt you. He twists her arm. Bloom squeaks, turning turtle. Bloom, don't be cruel, nurse, don't. Bellow, twisting. Another? Bloom screams. Oh, it's hell itself. Every nerve in my body aches like mad. Bello shouts. Good, by the rumping, jumping general. That's the best bit of news I heard these six weeks. Here, don't keep me waiting, damn you. He slaps her face. Bloom whimpers. You're after hitting me. I'll tell. Bello. Hold him down, girls, till I squat on him. Zoe. Yes, walk on him. I will. Flory. I will. Don't be greedy. Kitty. No, me. Lend him to me. The brothel cook, Mrs. Q, wrinkled, grey-breaded, in a greasy bib, men's grey and green socks and brogues, flour-smeared, a rolling-pin stuck with raw pastry in her bare red arm and hand, appears at the door. Mrs. Q, ferociously, can I help? They hold and pinion Bloom. Bellow squats with a grunt on Bloom's upturned face, puffing cigar smoke, nursing a fat leg. I see Keating Clay is elected chairman of the Richmond Asylum, and by the by, Guinness's preference shares are at sixteen three quarters. Curse me for a fool that I didn't buy that lot Craig and Gardner told me about. Just my infernal luck, curse it, and that goddamned outsider throw away at twenty to one. He quenches his cigar angrily on Bloom's ear. Where's that goddamn cursed ashtray? Bloom, goaded, buttock smothered. Oh, oh, monsters, cruel one. Bello. Ask for that every ten minutes. Beg, pray for it as you never prayed before. He thrusts out a fig fist and foul cigar. Here, kiss that. Both kiss. He throws a leg astride, and pressing with a horseman's knees, calls in a hard voice, Gee up! A cock-horse to Banbury Cross! I'll ride him for the eclipse stakes. He bends sideways and squeezes his mount's testicles roughly, shouting, Ho! Off we pop! I'll nurse you in proper fashion! He horse-rides, cock-horse, leaping in the saddle. The lady goes a pace a pace, and the coachman goes a trot, and the gentleman goes a gallop a gallop a gallop a gallop. Flory pulls at Bellow. Let me on him now. You had enough, I asked before you. Zoe, pulling at Flory. Me, me, are you not finished with him yet, succorous? Bloom, stifling. Can't. Bellow. Well, I'm not. Wait. He holds in his breath. Curse it here, this bung's about to burst. He uncorks himself behind. Then, contorting his features, farts loudly. Take that. He recorks himself. Yes, by Jingo, sixteen three quarters. Bloom, a sweat breaking out over him. Not man, he sniffs. Woman. Bello stands up. No more blow hot and cold. What you longed for has come to pass. Henceforth you are unmanned and mine in earnest, a thing under the yoke. Now for your punishment, Frock. You will shed your male garments, you understand, Ruby Cohen? And don the shot silk luxuriously rustling over head and shoulders, and quickly, too. Bloom shrinks. Silk, mistress said. Oh, crinkly, scrapey. Must I tip-touch it with my nails? Bellow points to his whores. As they are now, so will you be. Wigged, singed, perfume-sprayed, rice-powdered, with smooth-shaven armpits. 
tape measurements will be taken next to your skin. You will be laced with cruel force into vice-like corsets of soft dove couture with whalebone busks to the diamond-trimmed pelvis, the absolute outside edge, while your figure, plumper than when at large, will be restrained in net-tight frocks, pretty two-ounce petticoats and fringes and things stamped. Of course, with my house flag, creations of lovely lingerie for Alice, and nice scent for Alice. Alice will feel the pull pull. Martha and Mary will be a little chilly at first in such delicate thigh casings, but the frilly flimsiness of lace round your bare knees will remind you. Bloom, a charming soubrette with dobby cheeks, mustard hair and large male hands and nose, leering mouth. I tried her things on only once, a small prank, in Hollis Street. When we were hard up, I washed them to save the laundry bill. My own shirts I turned. It was the purest thrift. Bellow jeers. Little jobs that make mother pleased, eh? And showed off coquettishly in your domino, at the mirror behind closed-drawn blinds, your unskirted thighs and he-goats udders, in various poses of surrender, eh? I have to laugh, that all second-hand black opera-top shift and short-trunk leg naughties all split up the stitches at her last rape that Mrs. Miriam Dandrate sold you from the Shelbourne Hotel, eh? Bloom. Miriam. Black. Demi-mondaine. Bellow guffaws. Christ almighty, it's too tickling, this. You were a nice-looking Miriam when you clipped off your back-gate hairs and lay swooning in the thing across the bed as Mrs. Dandrade, about to be violated by Lieutenant Smith Smith, Mr. Philip Augustus Blockwell, Mr. P., Signor Lacey de Remo, the robust tenor, blue-eyed Bert, the lift-boy, Henry Fleury of Gordon Bennett fame, Sheridan, the quadroon Caricius, the varsity wet bob eight from Old Trinity, Ponto, her splendid Newfoundland and Bob's, Dowager Duchess of Manor Hamilton. He guffaws again. Christ, wouldn't it make a Siamese cat laugh? Bloom, her hands and features working. It was Gerald converted me to be a true corset lover when I was female impersonator in the high school play Vice Versa. It was dear Gerald. He got that kink fascinated by sister's stays. Now dearest Gerald uses pinky grease paint and gilds his eyelids. Cult of the beautiful. Bellow, with wicked glee. Beautiful? Give us a breather. When you took your seat with womanish care, lifting your billowy flounces on the smooth-worn throne. Bloom. Science. To compare the various joys we each enjoy, earnestly. And really, it's better the position, because I, often I used to wet... Bellow sternly. No insubordination. The sawdust is there in the corner for you. I gave you strict instructions, didn't I? Do it standing, sir. I'll teach you to behave like a jinkleman. If I catch a trace on your swaddles, aha, by the ass of the Durands, you'll find I'm a martinet. The sins of your past are rising against you. Many hundreds. The sins of the past, in a medley of voices. He, he went, went through, through a form of clandestine marriage with at least one woman in the shadow of the black church. church. Unspeakable messages he telephoned mentally to Miss Dunn at an address in Dolier Street while he presented himself indecently to the instrument in the call box. By word and deed, he encouraged nocturnal strumpet to deposit fecal and other matter in an unsanitary outhouse attached to empty premises. In five public conveniences, he wrote penciled messages offering his nuptial partner to all strong-membered males. And by the offensively smelling vitriol works did he not pass night after night by loving courting couples to see if and what how, how much he could see. Did he not lie in bread the gross bore, gloating over a nauseous fragment of well-used toilet paper presented to him to a nasty harlot, stimulated by gingerbread and a postal order? Bellow whistles loudly. Say, what was the most revolting piece of obscenity in all your career of crime? Go the whole hog, puke it out, be candid for once. Mute inhuman faces throng forward, leering, vanishing, gibbering, bloom. Poldy cock, bootlaces a penny, Cassidy's hag, brine stripling, Larry rhinoceros, the girl, the woman, the whore, the other, the... Bloom. Don't ask me, our mutual faith. Pleasant Street. I only thought the half of the... I swear on my sacred oath. Bellow, peremptorily. Answer, repugnant wretch. I insist on knowing. 
Tell me something to amuse me, smut, or a bloody good ghost story, or a line of poetry. Quick, quick, quick. Where, how, what time, with how many? I give you just three seconds. One, two, three. Bloom, docile, gurgles. I r r r repugnosed and r r repugnant. Bellow, imperiously. Oh, get out, you skunk. Hold your tongue. Speak when you're spoken to. Bloom, bows. Master, mistress, man-tamer. He lifts his arms. His bangle bracelets fall. Bellow, satirically. By day you will souse and bat our smelling underclothes, also when we ladies are unwell, and swab out our latrines with dress pinned up and a dish-clout tied to your tail. Won't that be nice? He places a ruby ring on her finger. And there now, with this ring I ve own. Say thank you, mistress. Bloom. Thank you, mistress. Bellow. You will make the beds, get my tub ready, empty the piss-pots in the different rooms, including old Mrs. Q, the cook's, a sandy one. Ay, and rinse the seven of them well, mind, or lap it up like champagne. Drink me piping hot. Hop! You will dance attendance, or I'll lecture you on your misdeeds, Miss Ruby, and spank your bare bot right well, miss, with the hairbrush. You'll be taught the error of your ways. At night, your well-creamed braceleted hands will wear forty-three button gloves, new powdered with talc, and having delicately scented fingertips. For such favors, knights of old laid down their lives. He chuckles. My boys will be no end charmed to see you so ladylike. The colonel above all. When they come here the night before the wedding to fondle my new attraction in gilded heels, first I'll have a go at you myself. A man I know on the turf named Charles Alberta Marsh, I was in bed with him just now, and another gentleman out of the Hanaper and Pettybag office, is on the lookout for a maid of all work with a short knock. Swell the bust, smile, droop shoulders. What offers? He points. For that lot, trained by owner to fetch and carry, basket in its mouth. He bears his arm and plunges it elbow deep in Bloom's vulva. There's a fine depth for you. What, boys? That yeah. give you a hard on? He shoves his arm in a bitter's face. Here, wet the deck and wipe it round. A bitter. A florin. Dylan's lackey rings his handbell. A voice. One and eight pence too much. The lackey. Barang. Charles Alberta Marsh. Must be a virgin. Good breath. Clean. Bellow gives a rap with his gavel. Two bar, rock bottom figure, and cheap the price. Fourteen hands high. Touch and examine his points. Handle him. This downy skin, these soft muscles, this tender flesh. If I had only my gold piercer here, and quite easy to milk. Three new laid gallons a day. Pure stock getter due to lay within the hour. His sire's milk record was a thousand gallons of whole milk in forty weeks. Whoa, my jewel, beg up, whoa. He browns his initial C on Bloom's croup. So, warranted Cohen. What advance on two bob, gentlemen? A dark-visaged man, in disguised accent. Hunder punt sterling. Voices subdued. For, For the, the Caliph Harun al Rashid. Bellow gaily. Right, let them all come. The scanty, daringly short skirt riding up at the knee to show a peep of white pantalette is a potent weapon and transparent stockings, emerald gartered, with the long straight stream trailing up beyond the knee, appeal to the better instincts of the blasé man about town. Learn the smooth, mincing walk on four-inch Louis the Fifteenth heels, the Grecian bend with provoking crew, the thighs fluescent, knees modestly kissing. Bring all your powers of fascination to bear on them. Pander to their Gomorrah vices. Bloom. Bends his blushing face into his armpit and simpers with forefinger and mouth. Oh, I know what you're hinting at now. Bello, what else are you good for, an impotent thing like you? He stoops, and peering, pokes with his fan rudely under the fat suet folds of Bloom's haunches. Up, up, Manx cat. What have we here? Where is your curly teapot gone to, or who docked it on you, cockyolly? Sing, birdie, sing. It's as limp as a boy of six is doing his poolie behind a cart. Buy a bucket or sell your pump. Loudly. Can you do a man's job? Bloom. Eccles Street. Bellow, sarcastically. I wouldn't hurt your feelings for the world, but there's a man of brawn in possession there. The tables are turned, my gay young fellow. He is something like a full-grown outdoor man. Well for you, you muff, if you had that weapon with knobs and lumps and warts all over it. He shot his bolt, I can tell you. Foot to foot, knee to knee, belly to belly, bubs to breast. He's no eunuch. A shock of red hair he has sticking out of him behind like a furze bush. 
Wait for nine months, my lad. Holy ginger, it's kicking and coughing up and down in her guts already. That makes you wild, don't it? Touch the spot. He spits in contempt. Spittoon. Bloom, I was indecently treated. I informed the police. Hundred pounds. Unmentionable. Bellow. What if you could, lame duck? A downpour we want. Not your drizzle. <laughs> Bloom. To drive me mad. Mole, I forgot. I forgive. Mole, we still... Bellow, ruthlessly. No, Leopold Bloom. All is changed by woman's will since you slept horizontal in Sleepy Hollow your night of twenty years. Return and see. Old Sleepy Hollow calls over the world. Sleepy Hollow. Rip Van Winkle! Rip Van Winkle! Bloom, in tattered moccasins, with a rusty fowling piece, tiptoeing, finger-tipping, his haggard, bony, bearded face peering through the diamond panes, cries out, I see her! It's she! The first night at Matt Dillon's! But that dress! The green! And her hair is dyed gold, and he... Bellow, laughs mockingly. That's your daughter, you owl, with a Mullingar student! <laughs> Millie Bloom, fair-haired, green-vested, slim-sandaled, her blue scarf in the sea-wind simply swirling, breaks from the arms of her lover and calls. Her young eyes wonder wide. Millie, my, it's Papley. But, oh, Papley, how old you've grown. Bellow, changed, eh? Our what-not, our writing-table where we never wrote, Aunt Hegarty's armchair, our classic reprints of old masters. A man and his men-friends are living there in clover, the cuckoo's rest. Why not? How many women had you say? Following them up dark streets, flat-foot, exciting them by your smothered grunts. What, you male prostitute, blameless dames with parcels of groceries. Turn about. Sauce for the goose, my gander -o. Bloom. They... I... Bellow, cuttingly. Their heel marks will stamp the brusselet carpet you bought at Wren's auction. In their horseplay with Maul, the romp to find the buck's flea in her breeches, they will deface the little statue you carried home in the rain for art for art's sake. They will violate the secrets of your bottom drawer. Pages will be torn from your handbook of astronomy to make them pipe spills, and they will spit in your ten-shilling brass fender from Hampton Leadhams. Bloom. Ten and six, the act of low scoundrels. Let me go. I will return. I will prove. A voice. Swear! Bloom clenches his fists and crawls forward, a bowie knife between his teeth. Bello, as a paying guest or a kept man. Too late. You have made your second best bed, and others must lie in it. Your epitaph is written. You are down and out, and don't you forget it, old bean. Bloom. Justice! All Ireland versus one. Has nobody? He bites his thumb. Bellow, die and be damned to you if you have any sense of decency or grace about you. I can give you a rare old wine that'll send you skipping to hell and back. Sign a will and leave us any coin you have. If you have none, see you damn well get it. Steal it. Rob it. We'll bury you in our shrubbery, Jakes, where you'll be dead and dirty with old Cuck Cohen, my stepnephew I married, the bloody old gouty procurator and sodomite with a crick in his neck, and my other ten or eleven husbands, whatever the buggers' names were, suffocated in the one cesspool. He explodes in a loud, phlegmy laugh. We'll manure you, Mr. Flower. He pipes scoffingly. Bybee, Poldy! Bybee, Papley! Bloom clasps his head. My willpower... Memory, I have sinned, I have suffered. <laughs> he weeps tearlessly. Bellow sneers. Cry, baby. Crocodile tears. Bloom, broken, closely veiled for the sacrifice, sobs his face to the earth. The passing bell is heard. Dark shawled figures of the circumcised, in sackcloth and ashes, stand by the wailing wall. Mr. Shulamowitz. Joseph Goldwater, Moses Herzog, Harris Rosenberg, M. Weisel, J. Citron, Minnie Watchman, O. Mastiansky, the Reverend Leopold Abramowitz, Krasin, with swaying arms, they wail in uh, Numa over the recreant Bloom, the circumcised, in a dark guttural chant as they cast dead sea fruit upon him, no flowers. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Voices. Sighing. 
So he's gone. Ah, yes. Yes, indeed. Bloom? Never heard of him. No? Queer kind of chap. There's the widow. That's so? Ah, yes. From the suddy pyre, the flame of gum campfire ascends. The pall of incense smoke screens and disperses. Out of her oak frame, a nymph with hair unbound, lightly clad in tea-brown art colors, descends from her grotto and, passing under interlacing yews, stands over Bloom. The yews, their leaves whispering. Sister! Our sister! sister. Shh! The nymph, softly, mortal, kindly. Nay, dost not weepest? Bloom crawls jellily forward under the boughs, streaked by sunlight with dignity. This position, I felt it was expected of me, force of habit. The nymph. Mortal, you found me in evil company, high kickers, coster picnic makers, pugilists, popular generals, immoral panto boys in flesh tights and the nifty shimmy dancers, La Aurora and Carini, musical act, the hit of the century. I was hidden in cheap pink paper that smelt of rock oil. I was surrounded by the stale smut of clubmen. Stories to disturb callow youth. Ads for transparencies. Trued up dice and bust pads. Proprietary articles. And why wear a truss with testimonial from ruptured gentlemen? Useful hints to the married. Bloom lifts a turtle head towards her lap. We have met before on another star. The nymph, sadly. Rubber goods. Never rip. Brand is supplied to the aristocracy. Corsets for men. A cure fits or money refunded. Unsolicited testimonials for Professor Waldman's wonderful chest exuber. My bust developed four inches in three weeks, reports Mrs. Gus Rublin, with photo. Bloom. You mean photo bits? The nymph. I do. You bore me away, framed me in oak and tinsel, set me above your marriage couch. Unseen one summer evening. You kissed me in four places, and with loving pencil you shaded my eyes, my bosom, and my shame. Bloom humbly kisses her long hair. Your classic curves, beautiful immortal. I was glad to look on you, to praise you, a thing of beauty, almost to pray. The nymph, during dark nights, I heard your praise. Bloom, quickly. Yes, yes, you mean that I... Sleep reveals the worst side of everyone. Children, perhaps, excepted. I know I fell out of my bed, or rather was pushed. Steel wine is said to cure snoring. For the rest, there is that English invention, pamphlet, of which I received some days ago, incorrectly addressed. It claims to afford a noiseless, inoffensive vent. He sighs. T'was ever thus. Frailty, thy name is marriage. The nymph, her fingers in her ears, and words. They are not in my dictionary. Bloom. You understood them? The yews. Shh! The nymph covers her face with her hand. What have I not seen in that chamber? What must my eyes look down on? Bloom, apologetically. I know. Soiled personal linen, wrong side up with care. The quoits are loose. From Gibraltar by long sea long ago. The nymph bends her head. Worse! Worse! Bloom reflects precautiously. The antiquated commode. It wasn't her weight. She scaled just eleven stone nine. She put on nine pounds after weaning. It was just a crack and want of glue. Eh? And that absurd orange-keyed utensil which has only what handle. The sound of a waterfall is heard in bright cascade. Pula fuka, pula fuka, pula fuka, pula fuka. The ewes mingling their boughs. Listen. Whisper. Whisper. She, she is right, right, our sister. We, we grew, grew by pula fuka waterfall. We gave shade on languorous summer days. John Wise Nolan. In the background, an Irish national forester's uniform doffs his plumed hat. Prosper, give shade on languorous days. Trees of Ireland... The ewes murmuring, Who came to Pula Fuca with a high school excursion? Who left his nut-questing classmates to shake our shade? Bloom scared. High school of Pula? Minemo? 
not in full possession of faculties. Concussion. Run over by tram. The echo. Sham. End of Ulysses 15E. Read for LibriVox.org by Kirsten Ferreri and Max Porter Zasada.